The story begins with a boy in a kinesthetic VR MMORPG game. His name was Leorium. He was a high schooler and played as a healer shuttle character in the game. Leorium and his two friends were in a game fighting with dragons. One boy shouted at Leorium for his false target. He advised him to see the healer buff properly. Lee apologized and used the Holy Mother's Blessing Stamina Recovery skill again. That place in the kinesthetic Hyper VR MMORPG game, Ergosphere Online. Players can pick roles, gain experience, grow, and explore this fantasy world. If someone wants, he can become a knight able to beat a dragon or a mage capable of summoning gigantic golems. So, this game's motto was Awaken a New Self. This game had over 20 million users with various roles and new experiences enjoying their fantasy lives. However, Lee thought that, in this game, the class Leo Riem had was the most unfun and boring out of all the healer. He watched others play the game while just giving them heals. He was a healer shuttle. His friends in a game were shouting at him, the dragon attacked them and they all lost their game. Yu Min Ho had died due to the high-ranking Grassland Dragon. Kim Soon H1 died due to the high-ranking Grassland Dragon. Leo Riem had died due to the high-ranking Grassland Dragon. A boy called the system and advised him to notify everyone to retreat. Another boy kicked Lee and blamed him for losing the game. The second boy stopped him from kicking him because they were inside a game. Yu Min decided to kick him at school. Leo Riem apologized to Hyun, the other guy inside the game. He told Lee that games are just for fun. He told Lee that even though it was a game, he still had to take responsibility for his mistake. He told Lee to prepare 600 high-quality potions for them during tomorrow's raid at 8 p.m. Lee was surprised after listening to about 600. He argued because that's over 300,001 in case he couldn't do that himself. He ignored his words and kept talking with his companions. They planned to play with the guys from the Shindoing High School, bringing the prettiest girls. He told Leo Riem to log out. He again reminded him about the 600 high-quality potions, and they logged out. Lee was upset because it was very tough for a healer to gather all that by himself in one day. No matter how much he thinks about it, even if he plays all day, he'll be able to get 300 at most. He was distraught because he knew if he didn't gather that all, then they'd beat him up just like last time. He called up the system to log out of the healer class character and log into the altar one. System log out from the main character and log into the sub character. He was getting a bit of motion sickness when he used the altar class. However, this was the only way he could manage to gather everything by tomorrow. Now, he was logged into the sub-character Avenger class. There was the highest ranked dungeon, Red Abyss. The people in the game were fighting with them. A girl could see that there was a pattern with an overhead strike. Two party members had died due to the primal Balrog. A girl told his companion that they couldn't kill them by themselves. He told her that he'd be distracted and he said Nuna to use her resurrection skill during that time. Nuna was a term used by males to address familiar older females. Supersonic speed enhancement skills had been used. He wanted to drive all attention to himself. Suddenly, he saw that dungeon's striking range was larger than he thought. Meanwhile, Leo Riem was spotted there. He used devotion to revenge anti-barrier skill, an endurance damage absorption skill and attacked that dungeon. The other players were shocked to see. They didn't know Lee. He was bravely fighting with that monster and cut him into pieces. Other players found him crazy and outstanding in that game. A boy told the girl that if he could take down the Balrog by himself playing as a character of such a hard class, he must be at least an eminent player, or maybe even a ranker from the Asian server. Suddenly, they saw a Balrog's ultimate the God's Flame attack. It was getting harder for them to overcome. Lee knew that the Avenger class's innate passive skill triggered the flower that blooms at sunset. If stamina dropped below 80%, he would get a 50% increase in power for 10 seconds. He knew that to finish this, he must use passive skill with the ultimate move. He was continuously attacking him and defeated the dungeon. It was a bit difficult, but he did. He apologized to the other participants because they were in the middle of the party raid, and he had just intervened. They told Leo Riem that they were all dead. He asked them if he could take one of the rewards. She said to take it all. He was okay with the one because he knew he could buy over 600 high-quality potions if he sold it. They both offered him to be a part of their party. He told them he was a high schooler and needed to study. They requested him to accept their friend request, but he rejected it. They thought that maybe he was rejected because they were low level. Lee thought it would be hard for him to stop halfway if he played with others. He asked the system about the real time and it was 11.20 p.m., which was too late. He told the system that he was screwed and needed to bring in the laundry and do his homework. He said the system would log him out immediately and turn off the game. Suddenly, he saw that the system asked him about logging out. Lee was surprised to see it because it had never happened before. That was a bug. 
He clicked yes, but still, there was a pop-up notification. He was wondering why that was happening. He again clicked yes, and the game was turned off. He was full of sweat. He went to do his chores first and to take his shower. His eyes were dry because he was playing for so long. Suddenly, he saw his body was shattering. It was like the data was transferring. Suddenly, he saw his body was transformed. His muscles pulled up. He looked like the Avenger. He did vomit. He did not understand what was happening. He saw his game. There was a noise that a master adaption of 78% confirmed. There was a voice that, from now on, the tutorial would begin. When he was about to touch that game, he saw himself on the top of the building. He was in his Nuna's room. He didn't understand how he managed to come all the way there. Suddenly, he saw a monster behind him. That was the game Black Beast. He saw a Black Beast behind him. Leo Riam was shocked that Black Beast was in the Ergosphere how could they approach the real world. As that Black Beast attacked him, Lee jumped from the building. He could see that he was still alive after falling down five floors. He thought maybe he was dreaming. He heard two men say the building had just blown up due to the gas explosion. Their reaction showed that Lee understood he was in the real world. That Black Beast again jumped from the building and attacked him. Lee knew that he needed to run from that monster. Everybody was talking because they only saw that the ground had become a mess. They were estimating that maybe it was because the cement overheated and exploded. He went to someone and asked them why they were not running. He told him about the monster. He noticed that nobody could hear him. When he touched the shoulder of a person, that person only felt a sense of touch. He told his friend that he felt like something pushed his shoulder. He was shocked to know that those people couldn't see him but that monster could. That monster was chasing him. He attacked with fire and flames on him. Leo Riam could see that everyone was burning in the fire flames, and people were dying. There was chaos everywhere. Lee wanted to run and do something. He ran to get away from that thing. He ran faster to save his life, but that monster swiftly chased, punched, and threw him aside. He felt like he was going to die. He had been beaten by his friends frequently. He didn't want to bear this anymore. He stood up and fought the monster with all his might. He tried to defend him, and something very magical happened. He was surprised to see that phenomenon. It was the same feeling he got when he used a defensive skill, Red Thorns in the game. He understands that he could use the skill the same as he could in the game. That Black Beast was continuously attacking him. He suddenly did a passive skill, just as he thought that situation was all related to Ergosphere Online. Lee estimated that he had to move like a game player if he wanted to live through this situation. That was to subjugate them all. Leo Riam used his Vengeful Spirit Sword skill. This skill reduces his defense to zero, dramatically increasing the critical chance for 5 seconds. He attacked that Black Beast and threw it aside. Lee was shocked to see the dead situation of that Black Beast. He wondered if he defeated the monster. He touched the body of that Black Beast. Black Beast is a mid-low grade level monster. He dominated that monster. Suddenly, the system started to blink. The system congratulated him on his success in clearing the tutorial quest. Lee was surprised because that was the QT system just like a game. The system asked him to choose the quest rewards. He saw a screen where rewards were mentioned. He needed clarification about what award he should choose. There were points in a mystery box, too. Time passed, and 30 seconds were left, and he didn't select the reward yet. The system told him that if he did not choose before the time limit, the prize would be given randomly, and the return would begin. Still, he was thinking of selecting the best reward for him. He felt that the monetary compensation would be helpful for that moment. Now, 10 seconds were left, and Leo Riam was not panicking. He randomly clicks. He saw that a power came on his way and tied him up. He hurried to his room and fell on his bed. He was back in his room. The next day, while making breakfast, Lee listened to the sad news of last night's disaster. In the news channel, the report was that there had been several casualties due to an unknown explosion near Shindibang Station. After investigating the cause, police and the fire department cautiously guessed it might be indiscriminate terrorism and were looking for eyewitnesses. Lee knew that what happened yesterday wasn't a dream or hallucination. That all happened in reality. Suddenly, Lee's sister returned home and asked him about yesterday's night. He offered her a meal because she was tired after her night shift. He told her to wash up and have some breakfast. She saw him and asked him who he was. She didn't recognize him. He said to her that he was her brother, Leo Riam. She suddenly takes out some electric device and attacks on him. He was making her realize that he was Leo Riam. She did not believe a man as robust as him could be her brother. She told him that Oriam was as weak as a kitten shivering under a car on a rainy day. He told her he had this appearance after he woke up in the morning. She did not believe that nonsense. He told her he could tell the things only a real Leo Riam would know. 
He told her sister about her weakness. She hated carrots and sesame leaves, and her jaws hurt since she grinded her teeth in her sleep. And she forcibly went on a blind date not long ago, and she complained to him while drinking because of how terrible that was. She still thought that he had done a research. He told her about their parents' birthday dates, and they passed away in a car accident. He told her that situation when he begged them to take Lee to the amusement park and said some terrible things to them when they said no, and he still regrets it to that day. That was his secret, he only said to his sister. She asked him again if he was Orium. He told her sister he didn't know what happened, but his body suddenly transformed. She was concerned about his wounds. He told her they didn't hurt and he had already gotten them when he woke up. He didn't want to tell her about yesterday's disaster because she'd be worried. She told him to go to the emergency room and was about to call them. He stopped her. She advised him first to get examined if something like this happened. He said to her that doctors wouldn't believe him. He assured her that her sister was still a nurse, but she didn't believe him. How could those doctors believe? She was concerned for him. He told her that he'll continue living like this for now. She told him that the teachers and other students in his school would never believe that he was Leorium. He said they'd go to the hospital if they didn't believe him. He assured his sister that he'd get an examination and get treated if it could be treated. She found him stubborn. She ordered him to grab his bag and get ready for school urgently. She was prepared to go with him to explain to teachers. She told him that her words would be more believable than those of teachers because she is a nurse. He told her he had a plan even if she did not go with him. She told him to stop complaining and obey her orders. The Orium agreed with her. On a roadside, a girl was watching a YouTube video in which a boy was reporting about last night's explosion in a Shindibang district. She thought that she should go and check out the situation because that district was close enough. Her name was Kim Shi Wiao. Meanwhile, a girl came to Kim Shi Wiao. She asked her what she was watching on YouTube. Kim Shi told her she was watching that news on her recommendation, so she tried watching it. Another girl said that YouTube's unexplainable algorithm strikes. Another girl asked Shi Wiao to introduce her to someone. She told Kim Shi that someone from her academy wanted to meet her. She said she doesn't have an interest in these kinds of things. Suddenly, they both saw a boy coming. Another girl thought that maybe he was there a hunk like that in their school. They didn't recognize him. Kim Shi told her friend that he may be a transfer student since he is with an adult. Her friend was excited to see her. Kim Shi felt as if she had seen Leo Riem somewhere before. Lee stood outside the staff room with her sister. Her sister told him that the story would be that the changes in his body were still being examined. She told him he had to tell the teachers that he didn't know the exact reason. Suddenly, Lee told her sister he had a stomach ache and needed to go to the bathroom. He went to the bathroom. In a washroom, he thought the teachers would never believe her sister even if she is a nurse. Instead, he may raise suspicions and get the police called on him. He decided that if that case would happen, he'd have to use the random box, the item he got from that. He got the item crystal of picked up skills. The skill he could use was the casters, a mind-controlling skill. After returning from the washroom, Lee thought that the Eye of Captivation skill is usually used to make monsters anybody allies or buff in PCS, so he had no idea what effect that would have on normal people. He decided to persuade his homeroom teacher first. When he reached the staff room, he found that teacher Jang was saying there are certainly students who change beyond recognition after breaks, but anyone would be suspicious if they're told someone's changed this much overnight. His sister assured him that his face is different, but the way he talks and his voice is completely the same. They noticed that teacher Jang was not ready to believe. Lee decided to use that skill. Suddenly, he saw the vice principal. Lee thought it would be better to use that skill on the vice principal because he could persuade the other teachers, too. He tried that skill on the vice principal. Suddenly, the vice principal called teacher Jang and talked about the whole conversation, which Mr. Jang had with Lee's sister. He told the teacher that they should believe in Leo Riem. Teacher Jang disagreed with the principal because Leo Riem looked completely different. The school's vice principal told the teacher that no matter what their students look like, the role of the true educator is to discover the actual appearance hiding within their students and to educate them. Lee was shocked after hearing the voice of the principal because he was going way too overboard. He asked Lee's sister about his disease because she told them that Lee had a rare disease. She said that the condition was unknown and that it was not examined. He was shouting that it's a rare disease if she didn't know the cause. The principal asked the teacher, Jen, if he should continue to treat Lee, who's caught a rare disease, as a scammer. Teacher Jang asked the principal how they would explain this to other students. The vice principal explained this to another classmate, Leo Riem. He said to teacher Jang to follow him. Teacher Jang tried to stop him, but he was quickly rushed towards the class. In a class, the principal announced to take care of the student Leo Riem. 
He informed everybody about Lee's disease. A student from the course imagined it as very heartbreaking and confusing. The principal got emotional and started crying. Students were shocked to see the principal's reaction. Leo Riam was disappointed to see the principal's response because he thought the principal would persuade others with logic. But he got emotional instead. Teacher Jan held the principal and told every student to care for Lee. The teacher told Lee to take his class. Kim Chi's friend talked with Lee and asked him if he was that loser, oh Riam. She was shocked that how could someone change this much so suddenly. He told her that he had an acute change syndrome disease, which someone got after taking much stress. Another class student found a joke that oh Riam was saying. Oh, Riam saw that it was taught to persuade everyone easily. Suddenly, Kim Shi said that she had heard about that disease before. Lee saw her and was shocked to see her beauty. Kim Shi's friend inquired about that disease, but Kim Shi avoided it, saying she heard it from her dad. She said that a person living in some town in Germany woke up one day and saw that he grew 12 cm and had a completely different face. It was something about a disability, some hormone secretion organ, or something. She asked Oh, Riam if she was saying right. He agreed with her. Everyone was shocked and somehow believed in him. Lee was shocked that everyone had started believing. He thought about how Yoon Hyung and his friends would treat him. He saw that Yoon Hyung was not interested. Suddenly, Kim Shi asked Lee oh Riam if he had earphones because she wanted to listen to some music during the study period. He gave her earphones. He thought that he was no longer himself from before. He was pretty short and was all bones back, but he had gained some muscles and became bigger now. So, from now on, he knew that Yoon Hyung and the others might not be bullying him anymore. He thought he could make friends and go to school like normal. In that altered body, he could do that all. He was still afraid after getting muscles in that body. In a corridor, Hyung and his friends were bullying him as always. Yoon Hyung said his friend Seung H1 made a move and hit him so that they could check Leo Riam to see if he could get out of it with that new body of his. Seung H1 was already ready to hit him. He attacked Lee and caught him from his neck. He challenged Oh Riam to get out of his move. It was all about Lee's thoughts. Nothing terrible has happened. The classes ended, and Lee told her sister there was nothing unusual. Suddenly, Kim Shi's friend called Lee. He asked Lee to come with them to have some chill time. He agreed to join. Suddenly, his phone rang. He received a message from Bi Kyun Hyung. They were calling him to the fifth floor's washroom. He told the girls that he had to go because something came up. She asked him to stop, but he didn't stop. In the washroom, as he thought Yoon Hyung attacked him, he couldn't breathe. He felt weak. Nothing would change just because his body changed. Nothing would change. Suddenly, he saw Old Lee calling him and making him realize nothing had changed. He urged him to snap out of it because he was no longer weakling Leo Riam. He was just scared, like always. He made him realize that he defeated that monster last night. Leo Riam realized that he should use his powers. He used to resolve for revenge counter skill and throw him aside with full strength. Hyung got angry at Lee's reaction. When he tried to attack Lee, Leo Riam started running. On a roadside, Kim Shi and her friend were standing there. Kim Shi saw Lee's headphones. Meanwhile, she saw Leo Riam running. She saw that he was scared, so she called him. He thought that he couldn't fight with them. Suddenly, he was kicked by a stone and fell. The boys reached near him. They started beating him and kicked him badly. Hyung was beating him continuously, and the other guys were abusing him. Leo Riem felt helpless, he mustered up some courage, used a skill, and tried running away. But nothing changed. Meanwhile, Kim Kai arrived there and told those guys to stop because she was getting a migraine. And she said to them that she had planned to play with Lee. She asked them to let him go. Yoon Hyung didn't know her and got angry on her arrival. Hyung's friend told him that she was the daughter of a pharmaceutical company's president and the wealthiest kid in their school. Hyung understood that she had no fear because of her power. Hyung told her to don't interrupt their business. He shouted at her and threatened her. She wasn't afraid and told him to take his steps back from her. She told him her nose was about to rot from his stench. She taunts him. He got crazy and was about to attack her, but Lee stood up and punched him. He shouted and pushed him with his power. All of them are standing. A boy was furious at Leo Riam because he had gone insane. The fallen boy stood up and was also angry at Leo Riam. He said to Leo Riam that he guessed Lee wanted to leave, but he said he would again be his opponent. Clenching Leo Riam's teeth hard, he warned that he should be prepared if Leo Riam didn't want to die. The boy stepped forward to attack Leo Riam, but Leo Riam quickly defended himself. The boy remarked that Leo Riam was all bark and no bite, unable to guard correctly. Leo Riam remained silent. He utilized his perseverance damage absorption skill to attack. The boy felt weaker compared to Leo Riam. Then, Leo Riam employed his damage absorption skill to counter-attack. The boy shouted in pain. Leo Riam looked at him and then used the grudge-bearing flower, which deals multiple attacks in exchange for health, 
to strike the boy. Following that, Leo Rium kicked him in the neck. This sudden turn of events took aback the boy's companions. The boy fell to the ground, and as he lay there, Leo Rium looked at him and grabbed him by the neck, intending to deliver a punch. However, Kim Shi we all intervened and told Lee to stop because his hands were bleeding. Leo Rium glanced at his injured hand. Kim Shi we all picked up the bag and informed Leo Rium that he had no further business with them. Suddenly, a boy called out from behind and moved to attack Leo Rium. Kim Shi we all performed some magic, causing the boy to collapse. Leo Rium didn't quite understand what had just transpired. Kim Shi we all and Leo Rium then left the scene. The boy who had fallen was highly furious with Leo Rium. Subsequently, Kim Shi we all began to bandage Leo Rium's wounds. She took a picture of him and remarked that his face was a mess. Leo Rium thanked her, and she asked him what he was thanking her for. He replied, thanks for helping me. She explained that he could consider this help as payment for letting her borrow his earphones. Kim Shi we all mentioned that she was running late and needed to leave. She also said she had something to discuss with Leo Rium but decided to save it for tomorrow. Leo Rium inquired about what she wanted to discuss, and she replied that they could discuss it over lunch tomorrow. Afterward, she left. Leo Rium found himself wondering what she wanted to talk about. He was curious, considering she was the daughter of a pharmaceutical company president, and might have an interest in medicine development. Suddenly, a computer appeared in front of him. It displayed a choice question indicating that a subjugation quest would begin in five minutes and asked whether he would accept it. Leo Rium was surprised to see a subjugation quest, and he thought it might be similar to the one from yesterday, where he had to fight a monster. He promptly refused, he had no interest in undertaking this task. Leo Rium pressed the no button, but the computer informed him that users with penalty points could not refuse quests. Leo Rium was taken aback because he had never received penalty points. The system then revealed that Leo Rium had accumulated 400 penalty points. It explained that he would be forcibly transported to a higher grade subjugation quest location corresponding to those 400 penalty points. Leo Rium was suddenly transported from one place to another, and soon after, a strange door appeared before him. Leo Rium gazed at the strange door, contemplating whether this was the monstrous entity he needed to subjugate for his quest. Suddenly, the system interface materialized and announced that the subjugation would commence in 10 seconds. Leo Rium asked what he should do to prepare within this brief time frame. A black hole manifested within the peculiar door and a menacing creature emerged from its depths. This creature was none other than the infected paladin Abel. Leo Rium's anxiety and astonishment surged as he had never encountered this monster in the game. Leo Rium and the monster drew their weapons, poised for combat. In the ensuing clash, infected paladin Abel attacked Leo Rium, who endeavored to shield himself from the onslaught. Although Leo Rium was uncertain about the nature of this formidable adversary, he was resolute in his belief that a sword was its primary weapon. Leo Rium advanced toward the monster and initiated an attack. He quickly realized that this adversary was exceptionally formidable in contrast to the erratic movements of beast and animal monsters. Leo Rium decided to rely on his skills to overcome this challenge efficiently. However, his attention was diverted as he observed his hand growing increasingly numb. Infected Paladin Abel launched another attack at Lee, who struggled to defend against it. Something felt amiss. Lee suspected that his senses were being dulled. Perplexed, he attempted to activate his tenacity for revenge skill, only to be taken aback when it failed to trigger. The system intervened, informing him that the skill was currently unavailable. Leo Rium was stunned by this revelation, unable to fathom why he couldn't utilize his trusted skill. The monster once again struck at Lee, who managed to evade, but he was astounded by the noticeable slowing of his reflexes. He began to suspect that he might be experiencing paralysis. Lee contemplated the possibility that the monster's regular attacks might be imbued with a paralysis attribute. He reasoned that a paralysis damage icon would typically appear in the game, which could explain his delayed realization. Uncertain of his next move and realizing that his skill activation needed to be blocked, Lee took a moment to compose himself and formulate a plan. He acknowledged his paralysis but noted that the monster's slow attacks were easier to evade. His strategy was to approach this challenge as if he were in an action game, employing a hit-and-run tactic. Lee believed it would take time to overcome this obstacle, but it was the safest course of action. Suddenly, the monster executed a move, and Lee attempted to defend against it, only to be stunned when his vision was obscured. Recognizing it as a vision-blocking attack, he decided to increase the distance between himself and the monster patiently waiting for his sight to recover. The monster lunged at Leo Rium again, sending him to the ground with a forceful blow. As he lay there, he pondered his next course of action. 
His vision had returned, but the paralysis inflicted by the previous strike left him unable to launch an effective counterattack. He fervently wished for a healer to come to his aid. With the monster advancing for another assault, Leo Rium summoned the last of his strength to retaliate. Realizing that a healer might not be available, he contemplated an alternative solution. He concluded that using an item to heal the paralysis damage might be his only option. Leo Rium called upon the system and requested it to open the two remaining random boxes he had obtained as part of his tutorial rewards. The system complied and unveiled the contents of the boxes for Lee. Inside, he found a golden branch, described as beautiful and adored by crows, and a semilunar tear. Lee expressed his disappointment, deeming these items as rather useless. Suddenly, the monster struck from behind, catching Leo Rium off guard. He let out a cry of pain. Leo Rium fell hard after he attacked the monster. He glanced at the items he had acquired from the random boxes and couldn't help but think that this was too much, no matter how random. Determined, he picked himself up, but the monster wasted no time and launched another assault. Lee did his best to defend himself, realizing that the paralysis effects had stacked, leaving him unable to counter. Frustration and desperation gnawed at him as he contemplated his impending demise. He wished for a solution akin to the in-game store. In a moment of clarity, Lee summoned the system and instructed it to utilize the golden branch to call crows and open the combat preparation page. With that command, the golden branch was put to use. Suddenly, many crows descended upon the scene, launching a relentless attack on the monster. The monster, in turn, did its best to fend off the feathered assailants. Seizing the opportunity, Leo Rium accessed the preparation page and swapped the semilunar tear gem for a paralysis medicine. Swiftly, he administered the paralysis medicine, and as the monster moved in for another attack, Lee vanished and reappeared behind it. The monster turned to confront him, but Leo Rium assured himself that, for the time being, the monster's attacks would miss their mark. Accumulating enough damage, he readied his ultimate skill, known as Pavane for the Dead, and unleashed it upon the monster. With a final, fatal strike, the monster collapsed and met its demise. Lee sighed in relief, admitting that he had genuinely believed he was on the brink of death during this encounter. It would have been dangerous if he hadn't noticed the existence of the combat preparation page. Lee called upon the system and requested it to open the reward page, as he needed a moment's respite. The system promptly followed Lee's command. This time, Leo Rium decided against choosing a random box and inspected the available options. To his surprise, the system displayed a cautionary message indicating that another user had intruded. Bewildered, Lee watched as an unknown individual suddenly launched an attack from behind. The intruder was taken aback when Leo Rium defended against the assault, using the Devotion to Revenge Anch Barrier skill. In response, Lee retaliated, but he couldn't comprehend why this person had initiated the attack in the first place. The mysterious person locked eyes with Leo Rium and once more advanced, launching an assault. Leo Rium struggled to defend himself against the relentless attacker and couldn't help but ask why the person was targeting him. In response, the person admitted to not having a particular reason, explaining that they had yet to give much thought to their motives for hunting in the game. The person then employed the Black Reaper comes skill, drawing blood from Lee and causing him to cry out in pain. Without relenting, the person closed in for another attack. Leo Rium found himself at a loss, as the person's speed was formidable. Suddenly, a girl intervened, employing the Labyrinth without exit skill to shield Leo Rium from the relentless assailant. Leo Rium and the other person shared a moment of surprise. The individual took a step back, astounded by the skill's effectiveness, recognizing it as an O-tier defensive support skill. From behind Leo Rium, the girl spoke up, revealing that she had come to his aid this time, not because of the earphones but because he would treat her to lunch tomorrow. Leo Rium turned to face her, realizing that she was none other than Kim Shi Weol, who had come to assist him. Kim Shi Weol had arrived to aid Lee, and inquisitive, he asked her about herself. She suggested they postpone the conversation until after the ongoing fight. Prepared for battle, Kim Shi Weol stood her ground. The other person approached, ready to launch an attack on them. Engaging in combat, both Kim Shi Weol and the intruder displayed nearly equal levels of power. Then, Kim Shi Weol utilized her skill, Trap of the Treasure Keeping Magic Beast, to strike at the intruder. The person, baffled by the nature of this skill attack, resorted to using Ghost Walking to defend himself, leaving Leo Rium astonished by the person's abilities. Kim Shi Weol, too, appeared uncertain about her next move, her nerves evident. Kim Shi Weol urgently called Leo Rium, instructing him to dodge. Confused, Lee struggled to comprehend her warning as the person closed in, aiming to strike him from above. Employing the Blacklist skill, the attacker launched an assault on Lee. 
In a last-minute maneuver, Leo Rium managed to evade the attack, but to his surprise, he didn't feel any discernible change in his circumstances. Kimchi we all shouted to Lee, urging him to open the reward page and select a reward. She clarified that the time limit for reward selection wouldn't count down when another user intruded. She emphasized that the only way for Lee to conclude this quest was by choosing his reward. Lee grasped the urgency of the situation, yet simultaneously, the hostile intruder continued to approach him with malicious intent. Leo Riam accessed the system, and as the evil person attacked him, they were shocked to find no wounds on Lee after the assault. Kimchi we all then informed the person that they were within the skill domain of her labyrinth without exit, which she had set up upon her arrival. The person found themselves trapped in the labyrinth, surrounded by barricades, illusions, and various traps that would persist for 90 seconds. Kimchi we all cautioned the person to remember this lesson well, threatening dire consequences if they didn't. Leo Riam initiated his return, and this visibly angered the person who vowed that Lee would be the one to meet his end next time. Determined, the person removed their mask and committed Lee's face to memory. The game concluded, and they all returned to the real world. Lee found himself back as well and his phone rang. Seeing that Kim Shi Weol was calling, he answered it. He answered the call and spoke with Kim. Kim Shi Weol advised Lee to return home for the day, explaining that the blacklist skill he had been hit with was a location tracking skill, which lasted for eight hours. She urged him to stay hidden during this time. Kim clarified that while it was a form of location tracking, it wasn't as precise as a GPS, so as long as Lee stayed home, he should be safe. Leo Riam was taken aback by this revelation and asked for guidance on what to do. Kim informed him that the person who had attacked him earlier was a PK user, an individual who accumulates bonus points by killing other users rather than completing quests for rewards. She strongly advised him to avoid encountering such people in the future. Leo Riam was left speechless by the gravity of the situation. Kim Shi we all promised to provide more details the next day, as Lee was in danger that night. Concerned for her safety, Leo Riam asked Kim Shi we all if she was also safe. He expressed his concern to Kim Shi we all, explaining that the assailant had marked her after helping him. She reassured him that she could protect herself. Leo Riam, however, remained worried about Kim Shi we all's safety. She fell silent momentarily before asking if he intended for them to spend the entire night together. Lee responded that he thought it might be wise to stick together from this point forward. Kim teased him, suggesting that it sounded like he wanted to form a partnership with her. Lee clarified that if they could do that in reality as well, he had no objections. Kim then asked if he was comfortable trusting someone he had just started talking to that day, catching Leo Riam by surprise. After a moment's contemplation, she requested his address, stating that she would come to his home and spend the night there. Leo Riam was taken aback by this proposal. After a while, Leo Riam stood alone, patiently waiting for Kim Shi Weol. Eventually, Kim Shi Weol arrived and greeted Lee warmly. They entered the house, and Kim Shi Weol expressed her trust in Lee by saying she was now in his care. Leo Riam couldn't help but inquire if she was planning to spend the night at his house. Kim playfully asked if he didn't like her, to which Lee responded that he wanted to confirm. Kim assured him that they had plenty to discuss later. She then mentioned that she intended to shower and requested some clothes to borrow. Lee agreed, and while she was in the shower, he noticed some notes left by his sister. The letters stated that his sister was working the night shift and would see him tomorrow. Kim Chi we all emerged from the shower, and Lee asked her if his sister's clothes fit her. Kim Chi we all confirmed that the clothes fit, and inquired if Lee lived with his sister. Leo Riam explained that they used to live with relatives but had been on their own ever since his sister found a job. Kim asked about his parents, to which Lee sadly replied that they had passed away. Kim Shi Weol was momentarily at a loss for words, but Leo Riam reassured her that he had grown accustomed to their absence since he was very young when they died. Kim expressed sympathy for the hardships they had faced. Curious about when his sister would return, she learned of a change in her schedule that would bring her home in the morning. Kim Shi Weol approached Lee, surprising him, and raised her hand toward him. She called upon the system and sent a party request to Lee, prompting him to think that it was just a party request. Without any apparent reason, Lee felt a sudden jolt of fear. He turned his attention to the system, and a dialogue box materialized, prompting him to decide whether he would accept Kim Shi Weol's party request. Kim Shi Weol advised him to listen to something before making his decision. She pledged to provide him with all the information she possessed once they became party members, emphasizing her commitment to supporting Lee to the best of her ability. She made it clear that she was willing to give him everything. Leo Riam regarded her carefully. However, she also issued a stern warning, cautioning him that if he ever attempted to run or betray her, she would grind him up with a mixer 
and turn him into a smoothie. Lee understood the gravity of her warning and took his time to contemplate his decision. Ultimately, he accepted the party request, surprising Kim Shi Weol, who admonished him for not considering it more carefully. Lee explained that he thought it was only worth a minor consideration. Kim couldn't quite grasp Lee's reasoning, so he clarified that he lacked the necessary understanding and information about the situation. He emphasized that a PK user was actively hunting him down, and he could not independently extricate himself from this predicament. He felt he was on the verge of a game over scenario. Lee explained to Kim that, given the circumstances, she was undoubtedly the best choice for him. Kim Shi Weol expressed her appreciation for his trust but then grabbed him by the collar, her frustration evident. She admitted to feeling foolish for getting so serious about the situation on her own and asked if he could relate to that feeling. Lee contemplated her words before Kim urged them to start devising a strategy. Lee inquired about the strategy for facing the PK user. Kim Shi Weol explained that her actions on the system were part of her plan. Lee, still puzzled about her actions, listened intently. She then disclosed details about a large-scale event called Horizon, with an unknown date. Kim Shi Weol proposed that they participate in this event and devise a strategy to secure first place. Lee Oriam was intrigued and questioned what first place meant in this context. Kim clarified that some players would be tasked with fighting monsters in the game. Tensions ran high as the formidable Death King appeared, and they lacked the energy to engage in battle. As a result, they decided to retreat to the floor above. One of the individuals in this group asked their friend, addressed as Archer Nim, whether they should also make a run for it. Just before they could be overwhelmed by the undead, Archer Nim swiftly drew his weapon and advanced toward the oncoming monsters, ready to engage in combat. The monsters closed in, poised to attack him, but Archer Nim skillfully executed his dragon killer skill, resulting in the demise of all the monsters. His display of power left the other individuals in awe and astonishment. Unimpressed with those who hesitated, Archer Nim remarked that losers should remain on the ground. At that moment, the system appeared, announcing that Beek Yun Young had advanced from Archer to Executioner. Kim Shi Weol and Lee stood together, and Leo Riem inquired about the nature of the Horizon event. Kim Shi Weol admitted that she didn't have all the details but was certain that the first place prize included 20 billion won and granting one wish as a reward. Learning of the substantial reward left Leo Riem in shock. He then expressed his skepticism about the wish-granting aspect, suggesting it sounded like a potential scam. Kim Shi Weol acknowledged that she had initially thought the same. Still, considering the exorbitant amount of money involved, she believed that within the illogical world they were now in, granting a wish might be possible. She mentioned that they had already ventured far beyond the boundaries of logic in their experiences. Lee contemplated her words before asking where she had obtained this information. Kim Shi Weol revealed that she had received an invitation letter after completing 10 quests. Lee learned that he would also receive an invitation once he had completed 10 quests. Curious, he inquired about the duration of Kim Shi Weol's involvement in these quests. She revealed that she had been undertaking them since the winter break of her third year of middle school, totaling 17 quests. She also mentioned that she had come dangerously close to death on around 5 of them. Lee Oriam calculated the years this spanned. Kim Shi Weol reiterated that she did not understand why or how she had changed, recounting her visits to halls related to VVR4 and Ergosphere Online, where she was dismissed as a delusional person. Lee then asked if her parents had reacted to her transformation. She cynically replied that her parents wouldn't even notice if she disappeared or was dismembered. Lee struggled to comprehend her statement. Kim Shi Weol then commented that her appearance hadn't changed much, as she was already quite attractive, unlike Lee whose transformation had been more significant. Lee felt a twinge of irritation at the remark. Kim Shi Weol added that if anything had changed, it would be her hair color. Suddenly, they heard a noise from outside, causing Lee to wonder if it could be the PK user. Kim Shi Weol considered it might just be noise but decided to confirm with her skill. Lee asked how she could confirm it using her skill, prompting Kim Shi Weol to raise her magical stick and employ the skill Watchtower of the Labyrinth, which created an invisible watchtower. She explained that this skill could also detect PK users, allowing her to know if they were being invaded. Leo Riem questioned whether using this skill might alert the PK users to their presence in the building, to which Kim clarified that the skill was invisible to the eye, and the Reaper class lacked abilities to detect it. Lee nodded, understanding the situation. Kim momentarily looked at Lee and requested that Leo Riem take off his top. Lee inquired about the reason for this request. Kim Shi Weol explained that she believed it would be strategically beneficial to tend to his shoulder injury. 
Leorium, still curious, pressed for an explanation regarding why he needed to remove his top. Kim playfully replied that she wanted to treat her eyes to a golden experience, so she insisted he remove his top. Leo Riem complied, sitting shirtless while Kim Chi we all stood behind him. She cautioned him not to move until she indicated it was done, as the skill would be cancelled if he did. Kim Chi we all then applied her magical stick to Lee's shoulder and used the skill oasis in the desolate labyrinth. Leo Riem found the skill to his liking. Kim explained that it would take time to address everything, including his shoulder, and clarified that she wasn't a healer. This skill served as a buff, increasing Leo Riem's stamina. Leo Riem examined his hand and then questioned Kim Shi We all about why she had formed a party with him. He noted that she already possessed high rank skills, so there didn't seem to be any benefit for her in teaming up with him. Kim Shi We all was briefly at a loss for words before she responded humorously, saying that she thought Lee would be easier to order around because he had been a loser before. This comment irked Leo Riem, and he expressed his anger. However, Kim Chi we all quickly explained that it was just a joke, clarifying that initially, she had intended to determine what type of user Lee was. But then something came to her mind. Lee inquired about what she had remembered, and Kim Chi we all asked if he recalled the purgatory opening event. Lee confirmed that he remembered that challenging raid event from their second year of middle school. Kim Chi we all confirmed that she was referring to the event that less than 0.5% of users could clear, a challenging task with the highest extreme difficulty in the game's history. She recounted how, at the time, she had been supporting a guild as a mercenary and remembered encountering Lee in that chaotic environment where most players were helplessly killed due to the event's absurd difficulty. She recalled seeing Lee running tirelessly around the battlefield without ever giving up. Leo Riem was left speechless upon hearing why she decided to form a party with him. Kim Chi we all then explained that she needed Lee at her party because of his passion for gaming. She confessed that she also yearned for such dedication. Kim Chi we all expressed that she had been looking for a conversation partner to share everything about herself. She asked Lee if he had experienced frustration over the fact that no one recognized his later account, to which Leo Riem affirmed. Meanwhile, in another scene, a man is engaged in a battle with a monster. He employed the Ancestor Punch skill to increase his attack power and then struck the monster. A girl standing behind him utilized the enemy defense reduction skill, beheading the monster in a single stroke. After their successful kill, she announced that they had cleared 20 quests. Her name was Yu Seungha, and she hailed from the class Queen's Guard. The man, Kang Ikju, who was from the class Soul Fighter, casually remarked that it had been quite easy. Yu Seungha proposed that they choose status points as their daily reward. Kang Ikju agreed with Yu Seungha's suggestion. However, Yu Seungha suddenly noticed something unusual, and Kang Ikju inquired about it. She explained that she had detected someone using a skill nearby, even though no active quest was in progress. Kang Ikju suggested jumping them, but Yu Seungha advised against it. She pointed out that there were only 50 seconds left, and they had no information about these users. Yu Seungha decided they should observe them further to determine whether they would be a boon or a bane. She instructed Kang Ikju to mark the coordinates for now and proposed returning tomorrow to conduct a more thorough investigation. Leo Riem found himself in a peculiar and unfamiliar place. Suddenly, a monster materialized in front of him. To his astonishment, a man emerged from within the monster. Leo Riem was taken aback by this bizarre sight and had no idea what he was witnessing. The enigmatic figure advanced toward Lee with hostile intent, causing Lee to panic and flee in an attempt to save himself. He sprinted as fast as he could, eventually reaching an exit door. However, he discovered the exit was locked when he tried to open it. Desperate for help, he looked through a small window in the door and saw Yoon Hyun playing a game on the other side. Lee urgently called out to Yoon Hyun, pleading for assistance unlocking the door, but Yoon Hyun remained oblivious to his cries. Finally, Yoon Hyun stood up and turned his attention towards Lee. His visage bore a bizarre duality, with one half resembling a man and the other half mirroring the creators Lee had been running from. Suddenly, Lee woke up from an unsettling dream. It had been a dream that Lee had just experienced. Kim Chi we all inquired if he had had a nightmare. Lee Oriam was surprised to find Kim sleeping beside him, as she had slept in Lee's sister's room. Kim Chi we all explained that she couldn't fall asleep in someone else's bed. She then asked him about the nature of his dream wondering if it had been a scary one or perhaps an erotic dream. Lee was taken aback and blushed at the question. The next morning, they sat down to have their snacks. Kim Chi we all reminded Lee that, as they had discussed the previous night, she would be selecting the quests from now on. She advised Lee to start studying skills in preparation for potential PK encounters. Lee agreed to her plan. 
Kim Chi Wial also cautioned him not to use his skills needlessly, as they could incur penalty points, resulting in poor rewards. Lee then mentioned that the money he had chosen as his reward the previous night had disappeared and asked if it was due to penalty points. Kim Chi Wial confirmed that the disappearance of his chosen money reward was due to penalty points, explaining that one penalty point equated to about 10,000 won, so the entire reward was confiscated. She added that if Lee were to be involved in a penalty quest, she would also be affected as his party member, making it even more bothersome. Lee assured her that he wouldn't use his skills needlessly from that point forward. Kim Shi we all appreciated his willingness to cooperate and complimented him on his prompt response. Kim then mentioned that she would head home to change and see him later at school. Before leaving, Leo Riam asked her a question that had been on his mind since the previous day. What would she wish for if she were to win first place in the event? Kim Chi we all playfully replied that she would build her own harem heaven filled with her favorite idols, shocking Lee momentarily before revealing that she had been joking. Kim Chi we all told Lee that if he performed well on their next quest, she would reveal her wish to him. Lee reminded her that she had promised to tell him everything eventually. As they continued their conversation, a car passed by Lee. Inside the car were Yu Seung and Kang Ikju. Yu Seung informed Kang Ikju that she had found an Avenger and a labyrinth master. She had used her unique passive skill, which allowed her to see the skills and specifications of users and monsters within a short distance. Yu Seung Ha mentioned that it had been worthwhile to search for them while people were on their way to work, as it would have taken them the entire day otherwise. Kang Ikju asked her what she intended to do and if she planned to hunt them immediately. Yu Seung Ha declined, citing the presence of too many witnesses in the morning. Yu Seung Ha explained to Kang Ikju that hunting Lee and Kim immediately was not essential, especially considering the penalty points involved. Additionally, she noted that Lee and Kim had classes that were not present in their guild, making them potentially valuable. Yu Seung Ha emphasized that until they understood the nature of the event, it was wise to consider recruiting them. Kang Ikju suggested scaring them into giving up by pretending to threaten them, citing their young age as a reason not to take them too seriously. However, Yu Seung-ha countered by stating that age didn't matter, skill and the ability to follow instructions were the key factors. She cautioned Kang Ikju that there could be hidden talents behind their seemingly innocent appearance and advised observing the two young players first. In the evening, Lee studied skills independently, recognizing that Kim Shi Wial, a labyrinth master, possessed many useful skills. He considered how her trap-type skills could complement an Avenger's abilities by luring enemies in and her buff skills could enhance an Avenger's counterattack abilities to deliver burst damage. Lee considered himself and Kim Shi Wial a good match and a strong duo for their quests. However, his thoughts were interrupted when two boys approached him. One of them inquired if he was named Lee and attended Hijun High School, which Lee confirmed. Suddenly, one of the boys drew a knife and pressed it against Lee's stomach, instructing him to accompany them for a conversation. Lee felt nervous but complied, following them to an unfamiliar location where four other boys were present. Among them, Lee recognized a boy named Yu Minho. The boy inquired with Yu Minho if Lee was the person they were supposed to confront, to which Yu Minho affirmed. Yu Minho then shouted at Lee, warning him not to run away and threatening that it would only worsen things for him. He instructed his companions to proceed with beating up Lee. Leo Reem felt utterly helpless and was uncertain about his course of action. He contemplated whether to outrun them, but he feared these boys would persistently torment him if he attempted to flee. As the boys closed in on him, Lee faced a difficult decision. One of the boys stepped forward, aiming a punch at Lee, but he swiftly bent down, easily defending himself, and then countered with a powerful punch that sent the boy tumbling. Following that, another boy charged at Lee with fury in his eyes. Lee remained poised and, with a swift jump, delivered a solid kick to the boy's face, causing him to collapse as well. Leo Riem realized that, no matter how many of them came at him, they were still human. Compared to the monsters he had faced in the game, they were no different from mere trash mobs. Undeterred, the boys continued to advance on Lee, who fought confidently, using his skills to fend them off. The injured boy commented to Yu Seung Ha that Lee was remarkably skilled in combat. Yu Min Ho's frustration grew, and he couldn't believe what he witnessed. Suddenly, a plan formed in his mind. Meanwhile, Lee continued to battle the other boys, besting them individually. One of the boys, driven by anger, finally attempted to attack Lee. Lee, however, swiftly countered with a mighty fist to the boy's face, sending him sprawling to the ground. Unbeknownst to Lee, Yu Minho approached from behind with a stick in hand. Yu Minho lunged forward, attempting to strike Lee with the stick, but Lee skillfully defended himself with his hand, leaving the stick crooked and useless. This unexpected turn of events took aback Yu Minho, 
before he could react. Lee unleashed a powerful punch that sent Yu Minho tumbling to the ground. Yu Minho seethed with fury and frustration. Lee continued to maintain his stance, keeping his foot firmly planted on Yu Minho's chest. Yu Minho's frustration grew, and he adamantly insisted that it wasn't over. He threatened Lee, proclaiming that he would gather the senior students to confront and harm him. In response, Lee Oriam calmly challenged Yu Minho, urging him to go ahead and try if he believed he could succeed. Lee began to step away, resolute in ending the confrontation. However, as he turned, he noticed another boy attempting to attack him with a knife. Lee quickly assessed the situation and prepared to defend himself. Meanwhile, Lee Oriam's sister, unaware of her brother's perilous situation, was on her way home. She hadn't had the time to prepare food for Lee Oriam, but she was determined to ensure his nutrition and well-being. She felt grateful that he wasn't unwell despite her busy schedule. To her surprise, Leo Riem suddenly appeared before her, drenched in sweat. Concerned, she asked him not to worry about the food. Leo Riem concocted a story for his sister, explaining that he had been playing soccer with some friends, which accounted for his perspiration. His sister inquired further, puzzled by the idea that a simple soccer game could make him sweat so much. Lee claimed that it had been quite some time since he last played, hence the excessive sweating. He had perspired profusely while trying to evade his pursuers, so his sister wouldn't become suspicious. Lee checked the bag his sister was carrying, his curiosity peaked. She noticed that despite his altered appearance, his behavior and speaking remained unmistakably O'Riam. Lee then candidly remarked to his sister that she still seemed somewhat uncomfortable with his new look. She inquired if her expression had given her feelings away, but Lee O'Riam clarified that it was just a sense he had. Finally, he asked his sister if, by any chance, she wanted him to return to his original appearance. After some thought, she affirmed that she didn't want that. His sister warmly reassured Lee O'Riam, declaring that she saw him as her brother no matter his appearance. He offered his gratitude for her understanding. Then she asked if he had brought a friend home yesterday, to which he replied negatively. While cleaning that morning, she noticed long brown hairs, which couldn't have been hers due to their length and unique color. This revelation left Lee O'Riam in shock. Suspecting that Lee had brought a friend, his sister requested an introduction. Meanwhile, Yu Minho, nursing his injuries and nursing a grudge against Lee O'Riam, decided to contact his friend Yoon Hyung Beek. He believed they had no choice but to deal with Lee, as he would undoubtedly seek revenge. Yoon Hyung agreed to take on the task of teaching Lee a lesson personally. Kim Shi We all approached Lee O'Riam in a classroom and suggested they go home together. This surprised everyone in the class. Kim's friend inquired about their destination, wanting to join them. Kim Shi We all informed her friend that they weren't going anywhere special, just needing to discuss something important, and promised to fill her in later. As Kim Shi We all and Lee O'Riam left the classroom together, their classmates speculated that they might be dating. Even the man nearby couldn't help but think about their relationship. Later, Kim and Lee stood together, sipping on some juice. Then, Kim Shi We all casually asked him if they should start dating. Lee O'Riam was taken aback by Kim Shi We all's sudden suggestion and asked her why she brought it up out of nowhere. Kim Shi We all explained that if they were dating, people at school wouldn't question them spending time together alone. She proposed the idea of dating for real and asked if he wanted to try it. Lee O'Riam, feeling a bit bashful, told her that if she brought it up so suddenly, he would need some time to think about it. Kim Shi We all agreed and suggested they talk about something else. Lee was puzzled by her shifting mood. Kim Shi We all then mentioned that a quest request had come in for a two-person suppression competition quest scheduled for today at 12.30. Leo Riem inquired if it was a team competition with other users participating. Kim Shi We all confirmed this and added that the competition's difficulty made the rewards even more enticing. In addition to the 20 million won prize, they would receive 12 status points, offering a significant opportunity for improvement. Leo Riem remarked that the competition would be much more challenging. Kim Shi We all agreed, acknowledging that they would compete against other users, potentially leading to unavoidable battles, especially if PK users were involved. Leo Riem understood the risks and considered participating in a competition as a duo with Kim Shi We all might be dangerous. Kim Shi We all asked Lee what he wanted to do, suggesting they could wait for a quest with lower difficulty if he thought it might be too dangerous. However, Lee rejected this idea and expressed his confidence in their abilities to handle any situation, including PK players. He assured Kim Shi We all that he could protect them if necessary. Kim Shi We all appreciated his confidence and confirmed they would meet at the quest location later that night. As they both arrived at the quest location, 
Kim Shi Weol asked Lee if he was familiar with the area because knowing the layout could give them an advantage. Leo Riem admitted that he didn't know the place at all, so he was looking around to get acquainted with the area. Leo Riem suggested that if they could locate the black door, it would be easier to plan their route for the quest. Kim Shi Weol was curious about what he meant by the black door, and Lee explained that it was the door from which monsters spawned with a rectangular appearance. However, Kim admitted that she had never seen such a door before. Their conversation was interrupted by the system's appearance, indicating that the quest would start in just one minute. Kim Chi we all decided they should discuss it later and focused on the quest preparation. She considered installing healing items and wondered if she should purchase items to boost their attack power. Kim Shi we all asked Lee if he needed anything for the quest, as they had the opportunity to buy one item with their money before it started and she offered to purchase it for him. Lee expressed his desire to acquire healing and speed buff items. Kim agreed to this plan. Soon after, Lee received a notification from the system that he had obtained the Virgin Marys, an item that would restore all defense and stamina, and a hunting hawk's feathers, which would grant a fourfold increase in speed for five seconds. Kim Shi we all then playfully reminded him that these items were expensive and requested that he repay her with strawberry milk and sausage bread the next day. Suddenly, their quest began, and a monster appeared before them. Leo Riem informed them that this monster was known for its incredible speed. The monster was known as the Wolf of Speed, Waihan. It belonged to the Gentle God tribe and typically refrained from fighting unless provoked. Its primary attack method used its remarkable speed to charge at its enemies and tear them apart. Kim Shi we all urged Lee to chase after the monster quickly, but Leo Riem advised caution. He warned that they could be caught in the monster's high-speed charge and pulled along if something went awry. He believed there had to be another approach. Lee then suggested to Kim that they should set up a trap. Kim Shi we all inquired about creating such a trap, and Leo Riem explained that they could use their skills to set up a trap at a dead end. He would act as bait to lure the monster into the trap, although Kim expressed concern about the risks involved in this plan. Leo Riem declared he could endure a few injuries if necessary. He also mentioned that avatars become stronger through combat. He instructed Kim Shi we all to inform him once she had finished setting up the trap, and he would lead the monster in that direction. As Leo Riem started to move, Kim Shi we all halted him. She expressed her concern that he was willing to undertake all the perilous tasks by himself. Lee continued on his way, reflecting on the fact that among monsters, the Wolf of Speed was ranked at Tier 1 for speed but wasn't particularly strong in terms of overall abilities. As Leo Riem continued on his path, he remained confident that as long as they executed their plan to lure the monster into the trap, they could subdue it effectively. However, his path was suddenly blocked by an unexpected presence. To his surprise, it was a specialized speed class user known as Juri H. Wang from the Wind Rider faction. Juri initiated a conversation with Lee, and he found himself momentarily suppressed by her speed. Leo Riem acknowledged her swiftness and realized that he couldn't afford to remain passive. He decided to employ the skill revenges for when the foe is alive. Oh Yunsen, a member of the Wall Builder class, arrived on the scene. He used the Celestial Wall skill to launch an attack on the Wolf of Speed, Waham monster. Following this, Oh Yunsen executed a combo skill called as the battle unfolded, Oh Yunsen noticed that Leo Riem was also closing in on the Wolf of Speed, Waham monster. Juri H. Wang was equally surprised to see Leo Riem catch up. Leo Riem unleashed the skill. With approximately 20 defense points at his disposal, Lee realized that losing this opportunity would mean he couldn't catch up to the monster. He knew he had just one chance, so he activated the skill and attacked the monster. After attacking the monster, Leo Riem realized it wasn't a critical hit. The critical chance must have decreased due to Waham's high dexterity stat. Juri H. Huang was furious with Leo Riem. She demanded to know what he was thinking and how he could try to steal their kill and ruin their plan when they were so close to success. In response, Leo Riem argued that this was a competition, so why should it matter? Juri H. Wang's anger flared, and she pressed him further, asking how he would feel if someone killed a monster he had stunned. Leo Riem was left speechless, and then he admitted that he had acted rather spitefully upon reflection. That was his intention. He then approached the monster once more to launch another attack. Juri H. Wang remained furious with Leo Riem. Still, Oh Yunsung expressed agreement with Leo Riem's approach, emphasizing that it was a competition and interfering with opponents was a legitimate part of the game. He believed there was no need to be overly polite in such circumstances and decided to use the game's mechanics to their advantage. Oh Yunsung employed the skill to obstruct Leo Riem's path. Determined not to wait, Lee attempted to use his skills to break through the barrier. 
However, he quickly realized that it wouldn't work as he had thought, as the skill only worked against external attacks. Not wanting to waste any time, he touched the wall and prepared to use the Avenger's penetrating damage skill until the barrier broke. Leorium believed that his skill could penetrate the barrier and affect it from the outside. Although the damage from Red Thorns was slow, it was still faster than waiting for the skill's duration to end. Determined to break the barrier, he used the skill. To his surprise, the barrier shattered much faster than he had expected, allowing him to catch up to the others quickly. However, when he reached them, he was astonished to find them standing still, seemingly lifeless. Lee inquired if they had defeated the monster, but Oh Yoon Sung explained that they had been in the midst of battling the creature when it suddenly vanished. Lee inquired about the sudden disappearance of the monster, puzzled by what had happened. Then, to their shock, the monster reappeared behind Lee. They were all taken aback. Leo Riem suspected that the creature had used a teleportation skill, but he couldn't believe it, as Waham wasn't known for having such abilities in the game. The monster advanced toward them, launching an attack on Oh Yoon Sung. This startled both Lee and Juri H. Wang. In response, Juri H. Wang employed her skill, Mega Typhoon Dance, to retaliate against the monster. However, the monster vanished again, leaving both of them astounded and infuriating Juri H. Wang even more. Leo Riem had never anticipated a scenario like this. He realized that if it indeed possessed a teleportation skill, it could easily escape any trap they set. This posed a grave threat to Kim Chi Weol. Through the microphone, Kim Chi Weol informed them that the trap was prepared and that she would be awaiting Leo Riem's signal. Leo Riem and Juri H. Wang stood there in dire straits. Leo Riem understood that luring the monster into a trap would be futile if they couldn't nullify its teleportation skill. He needed to seal that skill first before leading Waham to where Kim Shi Weol was waiting. Suddenly, the monster Waham reappeared with Oh Yoon Sung in its mouth, leaving Juri H. Wang both furious and immobilized due to the she had previously used. The monster advanced toward them for another attack, causing Juri H. Wang to feel nervous. However, Leo Riem courageously engaged the monster with his skill, shocking Juri H. Wang as he fought to save her. Juri H. Wang demanded to know what in the world Lee was doing. Lee, who was locked in combat with the Waham monster, replied to Juri that he had already informed her he would be less concerned about courtesy in this competition. Surprisingly, the monster started retreating from Lee. Leo Riem began pondering why the monster wasn't teleporting away and if it was due to damage accumulation. Juri H. Wang, visibly frustrated, told Lee that she could catch up to it immediately if her wind running skill weren't on cooldown. Hearing the word cooldown, Lee speculated that the monster's teleportation skill might also have a cooldown. Suddenly, he received a message from Kim Chi Weol on his phone, stating that the trap was ready. Leo Riem proposed a deal to Juri H. Wang. He would give her the panacea in exchange for her support. Juri H. Wang was skeptical, asking if Panacea was just some common item he could buy with money. She didn't seem inclined to make a deal based on that item. Instead, she turned her attention to her fellow, Oh Yoon Sung, and rushed to his side to check on his condition. Oh Yoon Sung was in a dire state. Leo Riem pointed out that she didn't have any recovery items, and he questioned her decision to use when her partner was attacked by Waham. He emphasized that he didn't like to play around with people's lives, but given the life or death situation they were all in, he couldn't simply give her the panacea. Lee reiterated that he also had a party member he wanted to protect, and that's why he was suggesting a deal. He asked Juri H. Wang to support him in his strategy in exchange for the item. Juri H. Wang appeared nervous and mentioned that this was a competition quest. However, her partner, Oh Yoon Sung, agreed to help Lee Oh Riem. Oh Yoon Sung emphasized that this was a game where their lives were at stake, and while competition was good, surviving the game was more important. He suggested working together and stressed that cooperation was fundamental to any game. Leo Riem and Juri H. Wang listened to his words. Oh Yoon Sung added that he was ready to support Leo Riem as well but drew the line at a plan that involved them getting injured. Lee reassured them not to worry about his safety, as his strategy put him in the most danger. He handed over the panacea to them. After a while, Juri H. Wang hid in a spot and pondered the first part of the strategy, which was the lure fishing tactic that Leo Riem had explained. Her role was to keep the monster's attention by pretending to hunt it, and lure it to the three-way intersection where the second part of the strategy would unfold. That was her primary task. Suddenly, she spotted the Waham monster approaching. She swiftly engaged the monster, using her power and the whirlwind dagger skill to attack it. However, the monster defended itself and blocked her path. Juri H. Wang believed that the monster's aggro was now focused on her. Aware that the monster might counterattack with teleportation if she pushed further, she headed straight for the strategy area, using her wind running skill to speed her way there. The Waham monster continued to chase Juri H. Wang, 
and she noticed that it was pursuing her without using teleportation. The second part of the strategy involved forcing the Waham monster into a corner, just as she had hoped. Oh Yoon-sun arrived at the scene and used his skill wall of the Centurial Kingdom to block all other means of escape, creating the perfect battleground. Now, it was time for the final part of the strategy, known as pinch hunting, which Leo Riem would execute. Leo Riem approached the monster and attacked it using his skill grudge bearing flower, multiple attack skill. After the attack, Lee realized that the hunt wouldn't end with this single strike. In the game, hunting Waham had taken a while because attacks didn't penetrate properly due to its high dexterity. To efficiently hunt Waham, they needed to lure it into Kim Shi Wial's trap and lower its dexterity, no matter what. However, before attempting this, he had one job, to make Waham use its teleportation skill and force it into cooldown. From their earlier experience, they knew it could only teleport conservatively twice. In other words, as long as they managed to handle two of Waham's teleportation attacks, they would have a better chance of executing their strategy. The Waham monster once again approached Lee to attack, but Lee defended himself and launched a counterattack. He was very confident that he could defeat the monster and wasn't afraid of getting hurt. In fact, he believed that the more he got hurt, the stronger he would become. So, Leo Riem used his skill revenge as a raging fire and attacked the Waham monster fiercely. Meanwhile, two men were closely observing Leo Riem. They had a mission to watch him carefully, as instructed by their guild leader. Their task was to confirm whether or not Leo Riem was a user capable of opening the back door. Lee used his skill revenge as a raging fire to attack the Waham monster, but the monster was still alive after Lee's fierce assault. The monster came at Lee again, but when Lee retaliated, the monster teleported away. Leo Riem realized that the monster had used its teleportation skill, and now it had only one use left, which was all part of his plan. However, he didn't know how the Waham monster would attack next, so he had no choice but to rely on a bit of luck. Lee waited for the Waham to approach, and suddenly, it reappeared behind him, moving in for an attack. The monster bit Lee, but he didn't lose hope and used the passive skill flower that blooms at sunset to counterattack the monster. Lee fell to the ground and noticed that the monster had disappeared. Leo Riem realized that the plan had worked, the monster had used up both of its teleportations. Suddenly, Oh Yoon Sung shouted that the monster had reappeared. Lee looked in the direction of the monster, but it was running away from them. They were surprised that they had almost caught the monster, but now it was escaping. However, Leo Riem knew that the plan wasn't finished yet because the Waham monster was heading toward Kim Shi Wial's trap. He believed that their party would win as long as he finished off Waham and the trap. Juri H. Wang was chasing after the Waham monster with her skill wind running. She told Leo Riem that since she had helped with his plan, she would be the one to deal the final blow. She reassured Leo Riem, saying that this was a competition, so he shouldn't be too disappointed. Leo Riem was left momentarily speechless and then replied that he wasn't really disappointed because they were going to win anyway. With the termination, he opened the system and used the Panacea and Hunting Hawk's Feather. He requested the system to completely boost his defense with Panacea and increase his speed with Hunting Hawk's Feather. Activating his skill, Lee sprinted towards Juri H. Wang and the monster at incredible speed. He was running so fast that Juri H. Wang, who was watching, lost her balance and fell to the ground. Finally, Leo Riem found the Waham monster, and to his relief, it had been caught in Kim Shi Wial's trap. Leo Riem utilized his field trap skill, which reduced the target's defense and dexterity until it escaped the field. He mentioned that he didn't even need to use his skills because, based on his calculations, Kim Shi Wial should also be using an attack buff skill. Confirming his prediction, Kim Shi Wial activated her attack buff skill. With the buff in place, Leo Riem swiftly attacked the Waham monster and successfully defeated it. He remarked that he would have had the final blow stolen from him if it weren't for the speed buff item he used. Curious, Kim Shi Wial asked Leo Riem how he knew about this. She questioned whether he had bought a speed buff item, considering this quest was centered around a battle of speed. Leo Riem replied that he didn't have that much foresight and never anticipated the appearance of a wind rider among the opponents. He explained that his only thought was to support Kim when she was in danger, and the best way to do that was to run to her as fast as he could. Therefore, he decided he needed a speed buff item. Kim Chi we all listened to him and playfully called Lee needlessly meddlesome and an arrogant idiot. However, she added that since they had successfully cleared the quest and, in part thanks to Lee's meddlesome attitude, she supposed she could praise him. Suddenly, the system appeared and announced that Kim Chi we all and Lee Oriam had achieved first place in the competition quest. 
they were rewarded with three high-grade item boxes for completing the hidden quest within 45 minutes. Both of them were delighted to hear this news. Leorium then checked their results and confirmed that they had secured the first place out of the three groups. He mentioned to Kim Shui all that he hadn't seen any users other than the Wind Rider team during the quest. Leo Riem wondered if there might be another team hiding somewhere. Meanwhile, the third team, consisting of the two boys who had been observing Leo Riem, discussed their performance. One of the boys complimented Leo Riem's skills, mentioning that he had a good sense of the game, and that the Labyrinth Master had mastered the basics perfectly. However, his partner expressed doubts, saying that all they had done was defeat a single Waham, and that it wasn't clear if they had enough skills to be recruited by their guild. The first boy argued that this wasn't just any Waham, it was a unique type capable of teleportation. He believed that considering the number of their guild members who had died due to unique types, Leo Riem and Kim Shi Wial's performance was exceptional and worth considering for recruitment. The first boy stated that he would give the Labyrinth Master 92 29 points and the Avenger 98 79 points. His partner expressed uncertainty, unable to determine if these scores were good or bad. The first boy clarified that the score he had given was out of 10,000 points. He urged his partner to assign a score as well. After some thought, his partner decided to withhold his judgment for now and would make a decision after observing the upcoming fight. The first boy noted that the quest had officially ended, but his partner disagreed, pointing out that the quest was not truly over because a PK user was on their way. The system presented them with a choice between status points and a random box. Kim Shi Wial and Leo Riem pondered their options. Leo Riem asked Kim Shi Wial about her choice, wondering if she would opt for status points since she mentioned wanting an upgrade. However, Kim Shi Wial surprised him by stating that she would choose money instead of status points. She explained that she planned to purchase a time difference generator, even though it was a tier 1 item auctioned at a high price. She highlighted the usefulness of this item as it allowed the user to reverse time for one object, essentially providing an extra life in challenging situations or when facing formidable opponents. Leo Riem responded by mentioning that they were playing in hardcore mode, where a single death meant it was all over, so having an item like the time difference generator could provide a safety net, taking some of the edge off. Suddenly, applause came from behind them. Kim and Lee turned to see Oh Yun Sung and Juri H. Chuang approaching, with Juri H. Chuang clapping. She admitted that she thought she was going to get the final hit and win but acknowledged that they had been completely outplayed in the end. Kim Shi Wial asked Lee about their identities, and he explained that they were the party they had competed with and had cooperated with a little. Juri A. Chuang inquired about Lee's relationship with Kim Shi Wial, and he responded that she was a woman he needed to protect with his life. They all exchanged smiles, and Lee clarified that he didn't mean it in a romantic way. Oh Yun Sung expressed his gratitude to Lee Oh Riem for their help and mentioned that, at the very least, they were able to secure the end place prize instead of facing death. He proposed adding Lee to his friend list and asked if Lee would accept the request. Lee hesitated, and Kim Shi We all chimed in, saying that if it was just adding them to Lee's friend list, it was fine. But they weren't interested in forming a collaborative relationship just yet since they didn't know what kind of people they were dealing with. Oh Yun Sung reassured them that they weren't seeking anything from their group, they were simply enjoying the game as if it were an extreme sport. They acknowledged that their classes were on the extreme end, making it challenging to attempt super hard quests. Oh Yun Sung assured Lee that they didn't need to worry too much and emphasized the importance of having friends to enjoy the game together. Leo Riem turned to Kim Shi We All and asked for her opinion. He mentioned that, from what he saw, they didn't seem like bad people. Kim Shi Wial, considering his judgment after their encounter, decided not to interfere further and stated that she was content with having a party member. Lee agreed, and Oh Yun Sung mentioned that there wasn't much time left for rewards, so he would send Lee the friend request. Oh Yun Sung was about to send the friend request when the system displayed a cautious warning that another user had intruded. Suddenly, a PK user appeared on the scene, causing everyone to become alert. Oh Yun Sung immediately launched his skill wall of the Millennial Kingdom and told Lee Oh Riem to quickly choose his rewards. However, the PK user managed to break through Oh Yun Sung's barrier and launched an attack on him, causing Oh Yun Sung to cry out in pain. Juri H. Chuang retaliated by using her skill lancer tactics against the PK user. Still, the PK user countered her with his skill floor of spears, human wave tactic. Juri H. Wang was shocked that the PK user was so fast, considering that she was a lancer specializing in speed herself. The PK user approached Juri H. Wang with the intention of attacking her, but he suddenly found himself ensnared in a trap. 
Kim Shi Wiall revealed that she had set a trap in that location as well and warned the PK user to be more cautious during battles. She playfully suggested that she should remind him to watch his head too. Then, Leo Reem descended from above and attacked the PK user with his skill, Labyrinth Master Skill, memo left by a person who died in the labyrinth. Lee managed to sever the PK user's hand, leaving him shocked and helpless. In desperation, the PK user decided to retreat and run away. Kim Shi Wiall noted that the PK user was fleeing from them. Lee, however, was left speechless as he saw Juri H. Wang and Oh Yoon Sung lying injured on the ground. Leo Reem assured Kim Shi Wiall that he wouldn't go after the PK user alone. He was concerned that the PK user might return to attack them after pretending to flee. To ensure the safety of their party, he decided to keep tracking the PK user and buy as much time as possible for Kim Shi Wiall to treat Juri H. Wang and Oh Yoon Sung until the return time was up. However, Kim Shi Wiall grew angry and insisted that Leo Riem shouldn't just stall for time but should aim to defeat the PK user decisively. She warned him of the risks involved and emphasized that if he returned safely, she would share her hidden mission with him. Just as she had mentioned before, Leo Riem agreed with her and set off to pursue and confront the PK user. Leo Riem was in pursuit of the PK user, and to his surprise, he suddenly found the PK user standing right in front of him. The PK user acknowledged that Lee had indeed followed him. Lee prepared for a confrontation and launched an attack on the PK user, causing him to fall to the ground. Leo Riem addressed the PK user, expressing his reluctance to harm anyone, regardless of their identity. However, he made it clear that he couldn't tolerate individuals like the PK user, who inflicted harm on others. Leo Riem presented the PK user with a choice, to run away and live a normal life quietly or to engage in a battle and be defeated like a monster. The PK user gave Leo Riem a disdainful look and commented that he had initially hoped Lee was different when he severed his arm so ruthlessly. However, he now believed Lee was just a pretentious individual. To Lee's shock, the PK user revealed a time difference generator and used it to restore his severed arm. This unexpected turn of events left Leo Riem rattled. The PK user then activated a field skill, intensifying the tension of the situation. Leo Riem realized that the PK user wasn't engaging in this fight recklessly, but had a well-thought-out plan, which included a backup strategy. The PK user menacingly informed Leo Riem that he would use his two hands to strike him down for real, and he advanced towards Lee to launch an attack. The PK user launched an attack on Lee, and both of them were engaged in combat. Amidst the battle, the PK user taunted Leo Riem, questioning why he seemed sluggish after all the talking. Lee looked at him and realized that the PK user's comment was valid. Leo Riem thought that his reduced dexterity and attack power were likely due to the one-on-one -on -one skill. He acknowledged that the PK user possessed remarkable speed, rivaling that of a wind rider. Recognizing the seriousness of the situation, Lee understood that even a slight lapse in his guard could lead to defeat. The PK user continued his assault by using the skill, and Leo Riem defended himself from the attack. To his surprise, he managed to block the attack but he still sustained damage. Lee began to wonder if there was more to Halberd and one-on-one -on -one than met the eye, particularly with regard to their defense ignoring fixed damage effects. Suddenly, the PK user rushed toward Lee and launched an attack on him. Lee managed to defend against the attack but sustained some minor damage. He wondered if this was a special effect of a totem item. Lee also considered that the PK user had impressive base stats and exceptional skill and item usage. It seemed like the PK user had been playing like this for a long time. With this in mind, Lee decided to counterattack. He rushed toward the PK user and launched an assault. The PK user, named Oriam, confidently stated that Lee couldn't match his speed, so he intended to engage in close combat. Oriam questioned how Lee could survive with such sloppy skills and then unleashed an attack using his skill. He launched an attack on Lee, resulting in a powerful blast. Following this attack, the PK user chuckled, believing that he had defeated and shattered Leo Riem into little pieces. To his surprise, Lee reappeared from the other side and began running away. The PK user taunted Lee, claiming that he couldn't defeat him and accusing him of running away. Furious, the PK user pursued Leo Riem and used his skill. Lee continued to flee and was shocked by the intensity of the attack. Another blast ensued, and this time, the PK user was convinced that Lee had been defeated. However, he was astonished to see Leo Riem successfully defend against the attack. Leo Riem retaliated by launching a counterattack on the PK user, employing his skill. Lee realized that his expectation had been correct. He knew that the PK user would use Javelin if he attempted to leave the one-on-one -on -one field. 
Leorium suspected that his opponent was the master PK user, which meant the PK user would likely use a standard skill combination. Lee believed that if he could discern this strategy and use perseverance to absorb the damage, he could compensate for the reduced attack power imposed by the one-on-one -on -one rule. With determination, Lee raised his sword, leaving the PK user puzzled about his next move. Without warning, Lee initiated an attack on the PK user, utilizing his skill. He understood that he couldn't evade a fixed damage effect, but in return, he could reflect the damage received. The attack took the PK user by surprise, landing a powerful blow and inflicting damage upon him. This unexpected turn of events infuriated the PK user, prompting him to employ his ultimate skill, Rush of World Conquest, and launch a retaliatory attack on Leo Riem. The PK user was determined to eliminate Lee with his attack. Lee, unable to fully withstand the assault, sustained injuries. The PK user inquired about the impact of his attack on Lee. In response, Lee requested a moment, causing the PK user to pause and be surprised. He considered the duration of the one-on-one -on -one skill. Leo Riem clarified that the one-on-one -on -one skill had a duration of 200 seconds. This revelation shocked the PK user. Lee continued, explaining that, accounting for some minor differences, this duration was more than sufficient. He was confident that he wouldn't lose to the PK user even in a nerf state. Frustrated and angered by Lee's confidence, the PK user prepared to launch another attack. Leo Riem advanced toward the PK user, asserting that without nerfs or handicaps, the PK user was no match for him. He followed through with an attack on the PK user, who cried out in pain and fell to the ground. Overwhelmed and nervous, the PK user felt helpless. Approaching the PK user, Leo Riem warned him not to even think about using a recovery item. He reminded the PK user that, as a gamer, he should know that the difference in their skills couldn't be bridged with just a few items. The PK user listened quietly. Leo Riem questioned the PK user's motives. He emphasized that even if the PK user called it PK, this wasn't a game but reality, and what he was doing amounted to murder. Lee asked the PK user what he had to gain from such actions. Was it for the event rewards, or did he find joy in tormenting others? The PK user found himself at a loss for words and seething with anger towards Lee. He then asked Lee if his own family members still recognized his face. The PK user claimed that his entire life had been taken away from him. Continuing, he revealed that after turning into his game avatar, his friends and family no longer recognized him. To them, he was as good as dead. The PK user concluded by questioning why he should care about anything he did anymore. He didn't need things like quests or events. He didn't understand why this was happening, but he was determined to destroy it all. He vowed to put an end to everything. The PK user was about to say something, but suddenly, someone attacked and killed him. Lee was also taken aback by this sudden turn of events. Lee was shocked not only by the sudden attack but also by the class of the weapon used. Then, a man appeared, the one who had attacked the PK user. He commented that he had thought Lee would be dead by now but was surprised to see him still alive. Lee, filled with anger, responded, Reaper. The Reaper and Lee stood facing each other. The Reaper began absorbing the status points and items of the PK user, leaving Lee perplexed. The Reaper then informed Lee that he was the next target on his list. Lee, ready to defend himself, asked the Reaper if he was the same person who had been killing individuals out of spite because they had lost everything in their lives due to the game. The Reaper seemed confused by this question and replied that he didn't need a reason for his actions, as he had likely mentioned before. He stated that in both reality and the game, he did whatever it took to win. The Reaper moved in for an attack on Lee. Lee, however, chose not to defend and took the hit, sustaining an injury. He realized that this version of the Reaper seemed even faster than when they had fought previously. Did the Reaper upgrade during that time? Lee wondered. Without hesitation, Lee used the skill Red Thorns and launched an attack against the Reaper. The Reaper, clearly angered, responded aggressively. Out of nowhere, an unknown assailant attacked Lee with their own skill. Lee struggled to handle this unexpected attack and realized that the skill used didn't belong to the Reaper's class. Suddenly, a girl appeared on the scene and attacked Lee as well. She admitted to missing her target. Lee asked if she was a necromancer. Another boy appeared and questioned Lee's comments, stating that this wasn't the first time and criticizing Lee's skills as worthless. The girl threatened Lee, suggesting he might want to die. Lee began to suspect that these newcomers were on the Reaper's side. Suddenly, the Reaper aimed his weapon at the man and warned him not to interfere, stating that he would kill the man if he got in his way. The boy quickly clarified that they were not there to steal the Reaper's target but merely to capture the escaped Lancer who they had encountered by chance. He emphasized that not laying hands on each other's prey was a condition of their alliance. The Reaper fell silent for a moment. 
The man asked the Reaper why he wouldn't at least let them assist him, pointing out that they also wanted to eliminate the Avenger who had taken their job. The Reaper agreed and told them to do as they pleased. Then, the Reaper resumed his attack on Lee, who was forced to defend himself once again. Meanwhile, the girl launched an attack on Lee using her skill bone needles, and the boy attacked Lee from behind. Lee turned to face the boy. The man then utilized his skill, relaxing slaughter, critical hit, resulting in a powerful blast. They believed they had finally taken down Lee, but their victory was short-lived. Someone intervened to save Lee from their attacks. It was the individual who had been keeping an eye on Lee, and he questioned whether he ever thought he'd have to fight in his pajamas. He humorously mentioned his superhero-like landing and used the skill Dragon Sword Shrine to rescue Lee. Leo Reem speculated that this skill and weapon might belong to the rare class that only three people in their country possessed, the Dragon Slayer. The guy confirmed Lee's suspicion, saying that Lee was correct. The guy who had come to Lee's rescue commented that while he had a rare class, Lee was no different. He noted that not many people chose a different class to handle situations like avenging. Lee contemplated this statement, but the guy urged him to save the chitchat for later. He had come to help Lee, and their job was to eliminate the insects. The guy launched an attack on the Reaper, the girl, and the man who had been assisting the Reaper. The man was shocked and warned that the guy was about to use a wide area stun skill. With a powerful skill called Dragon Silence, the guy from the rare class unleashed a devastating attack that they could barely withstand. After the successful attack, the guy told Lee to choose his reward and end the quest. He emphasized the difficulty of fighting the Chaos Bastards for real with just the two of them. Lee was concerned about his friends and the others still trapped. The guy reassured Lee not to worry about his friends, explaining that his monk comrade was treating them with his blessing skill. He advised Lee to choose his reward, emphasizing that the quest would end as soon as he made his selection. Suddenly, the Reaper used his skill and launched an attack on the guy from the rare class, causing him to panic. However, his partner arrived just in time and countered the Reaper with his skill, Demon Crushing Palm, shattering the Reaper into little pieces. The guy was overjoyed to see his partner's arrival. Kim Shi We all then appeared and informed them that everyone was healed, giving Lee the green light to end the quest. Leo Riam agreed, and he asked the guy for the identities of the people who had helped them. The guy revealed that they were from the Guild Racin, and he hinted that they would meet again soon, thanks to his partner giving them a perfect score. The next day, Yu Soon was standing by after swimming when the bell rang on her smartwatch. She turned to Hyun Soon and inquired about the events of the previous night. Hyun Soon replied affirmatively, mentioning that despite some unexpected occurrences, they had managed to monitor everything effectively. Yu Soon then asked for Hyun Soon's opinion on the matter. She inquired whether he found them useful. Hyun Soon responded that he and Wu Young had jointly assessed the situation and had agreed that both the Labyrinth Master and the Avenger were valuable assets. Furthermore, he noted that the Avenger displayed a complete lack of fear when engaging in high-risk battles. It seemed that Lee had encountered numerous challenges, not only in the game but also in real life. In summary, Yu Soon Ha asked if he was essentially a wild beast. Hyun Soon concurred, adding that Lee also possessed a strong foundation making him exceptionally skilled in item usage and strategy. So, do not hesitate to recruit them before they become more formidable and potentially oppose us, Hyun Soon advised. The girl couldn't help but laugh and commented on how unusual it was to see Hyun Soon so actively involved in the recruitment process. Yu Soon Ha agreed to arrange a meeting with these individuals. Wu Yung chimed in, teasing Hyun Soon about his fondness for hardcore mode players. Hyun Soon playfully told him to be quiet. Then, Hyun Soon informed Yu Soon of another important matter, the chaos had started to move once again. This revelation surprised the girl, and she asked him if this information was something he could guarantee. Hyun Soon confidently affirmed that he was certain of it. He mentioned that it seems they need to prepare for a guild battle. Yu Soon was somewhat taken aback, asking for clarification, a guild battle. She stated that she would make preparations for it with Ikju and inform the others of the situation. Yusuma expressed her frustration at the chaos, likening them to insensible creatures that couldn't grasp the seriousness of the situation. She felt that since they had shown hostility, there was no choice but to deal with them. Later that night, someone was at the door, tied up with a rope. Kang Ikju arrived, and Yusuma joined them. She asked if the person had revealed any information. Kang Ikju replied that despite using skills to wake the person up and keeping them awake for 100 hours, they still hadn't spoken. Ikju remarked that it appeared the person had prepared themselves for death. Yu Soon responded by saying that if that was the case, then it couldn't be helped. She kicked the person, causing them to fall to the ground. Yu Soon then placed her sword at his neck and issued a stern warning. 
She explained the rules to him, emphasizing the importance of listening carefully. She stated that she would repeatedly stab him until he was on the brink of death, at which point she would use a recovery potion to heal him. Each time he was healed, he would have an opportunity to provide answers. Yusuna had five recovery potions, meaning the man had five chances to talk. If he answered their questions within that time, he would successfully complete the game. If he failed to do so, it would be game over. She told him that there were only two things they wanted to know, the location of Chaos's base of operations and the personal information of the boss who led Chaos. The person responded by saying that he didn't know anything about those matters. He claimed to be at the bottom of the ladder and had never even seen his boss. Yusuna informed him that such excuses were useless, as there were no exceptions to the rules of the game. She asked if they should begin the game and mentioned that she was starting to get bored since there hadn't been any interesting quests lately. She even suggested trying to kill him with a skill she didn't regularly use, which made the person nervous. The following day, Leo Riem and Kim Shi Wial were on their way somewhere. Lee wondered what kind of people made up the Raisin Guild. He noted that they didn't seem like bad people. Kim Shi Wial explained that the Raisin Guild was one of the top three guilds in the game, with a membership of 800 players, and it had been around for a long time. She added that while Radon had only engaged in ordinary activities such as raids and guild battles in the game, it didn't necessarily mean that the real-life race and guild they had encountered would be the same. Kim suggested that, given the Horizon event was at stake, the race and guild might be involved in activities beyond just the game. Leo Riem agreed, acknowledging that people tended to go to great lengths when money was involved. Kim proposed keeping their distance from the guild and observing from afar. However, their conversation was interrupted by a man named Beek Yunhyang, who called out to Leo Riem. Beek Yunhyang requested that Lee come with him for a moment, as there was something they needed to discuss. Kim Shi Wial became angry and questioned Beek Yunhyang's intentions, asking why he had anything to say to Lee after everything that had happened. Beek Yunhyang told Kim not to interfere, stating that this was for Leo Riem's benefit. This further infuriated Kim, and she questioned Lee's decision to follow Beek Yunhyang. Leo Riem explained that he wanted to at least hear what Beek Yunhyang had to say. He pointed out that Beek Yunhyang had mentioned he needed to discuss something, so it would be strange if he just walked away. Lee also reassured Kim Chi Wial, saying that he could handle any situation that might arise. Kim was left speechless as Lee proceeded to accompany Beek Yunhyang. While on the way, Leo Riem asked Beek Yunhyang what he wanted to discuss. Beek Yunhyang informed Lee that Soon Wen had been seriously injured and hospitalized after his fight with Lee. This came as a surprise to Lee. Beek Yunhyung added that Seung Wen had suffered fractures and was hospitalized for a while. Although Seung Wen had mostly recovered, the issue was that due to Lee's actions, Seung Wen's parents were planning to file a lawsuit against him. Lee Oh Riem was shocked to hear this news. Lee responded by pointing out that the fight had been between the two of them, and Seung Wen hadn't initially made a big deal out of it. Beek Yunhyang explained that Seung Wen had avoided reporting it to the police because he was preparing for a career in sports. However, something seemed to have changed Seung Wen's mind, and it had been several weeks since the incident. Beek Yunhyang expressed uncertainty about what the police might do at this point, but the fact remained that it could spell trouble for Lee if they decided to investigate. He warned Lee that at the very least, expulsion from school was a possibility, and at worst, Lee could be arrested. This revelation left Lee in shock and filled with anxiety. Meanwhile, Kim Shi Wial had been eavesdropping on their conversation. Beek Yunhyang continued, saying that there might still be a way out for Lee. He revealed that Seun Wen's parents had sought legal advice from a law firm owned by his father. In response, Leo Riem asked if this meant that a lawyer affiliated with Beek Yunhyang's father would be handling his case. Beek Yunhyang confirmed that Lee's understanding was correct and emphasized that there was still a way for him to handle the situation. He explained that he could persuade the lawyer affiliated with his father to encourage Seung Wen's parents not to press charges against Lee. Instead, they could work towards an agreement that would resolve the case peacefully. Intrigued, Leo Riem inquired about the specifics of this agreement and what he needed to do to make it happen. Beek Yunhyang assured him it was quite simple. Lee just had to make a sincere apology to Seung Wen. By doing so, Beek Yunhyang would use his influence to persuade Seung Wen and assist Lee in resolving the incident without further legal consequences. Beek Yunhyang also pointed out that Lee wasn't entirely blameless in the matter. The fact that Seung Wen was injured and admitted is Lee's fault. Lee was surprised, thinking that it wasn't his fault. Leo Riem was shivering, and Beek Yunhyang looked at Lee, thinking that this kind of face suited him best. Lee's face was stained with a sense of defeat caused by his frustration from the injustice. The face Lee had whenever he was with him suited him best, no matter how strong he was or how good at fighting. There was nothing he could do about it. 
Bi Kyunhyung thought that in society, if they didn't have power or money, all they could do was apologize for things they did nothing wrong in. Lee Oryun was left speechless. Then he said to Bi Kyunhyung that he doesn't feel like apologizing to Kim Seung Won, not even a single bit. Moreover, Kim Seung Won not only tormented him but also tried to strike Kim Chi Wial, who was trying to help me. Lee Oryun stated that he can bear anything else, but that's unforgivable. He can endure it when he is the one suffering, but he will not forgive anyone who harms others because of him. Bi Kyun Hung became furious with Lee. Lee Oryum continued, So, tell Soom Won that if he wants to sue me, then he can go ahead and sue me. No matter what happens, I won't back down from this. Lee Oryum and Bi Kyun Hyung continued their conversation, unaware that Kim Shi Wial was listening to their discussion from behind a wall. Bi Kyun Hung asked Lee if he meant that he didn't care about the results of the investigation. Lee Oryum clarified that he was indicating that if Bi Kyun Hyung was going to confront him like this, he wouldn't shy away from it either. Ultimately, if an inquiry into the incident began, both he and Kim Soong Won would have no option but to disclose everything Soong Won had done to him. Lee pointed out that they were all aware of how disadvantageous that would be. Lee Kyun Hung was left speechless, and Lee O Ryum headed back, stating that he had said all he needed to say. Lee O Ryum remained resolute, declaring that he wouldn't back down whether they went to court or reached an agreement. However, Bi Kyun Hyung then brought up Lee's sister, causing Lee to be taken aback and turned to look at him. Bi Kyun Hyung continued, suggesting that if the police got involved, Lee's sister might discover the extent of the harassment Lee had endured. He questioned whether Lee's sister would be able to handle such a harsh truth. Bi Kyun Hyung acknowledged that although Lee's sister had suddenly become an orphan and had done her utmost to provide a decent life for her younger brother, the revelation that Lee was an outcast could shatter her, even if she was strong-willed. Lee Oryum pondered this possibility and was visibly shocked. Lee Oryum's anger flared, and he confronted Bi Kyun Hyung about his knowledge of Lee's family's circumstances. Bi Kyun Hyung admitted that they had attended the same school, which further fueled Lee's anger. Lee grabbed Bi Kyun Hyung by the neck and demanded to know why Bi had done nothing to intervene until now. Bi Kyun Hyung was taken aback and asked what Lee meant. Lee Oryum pointed out that Bi Kyun Hyung had been aware of his and his sister's situation, so why had he simply observed from the sidelines? Lee questioned why Bi hadn't taken action to prevent the harassment he had endured. Kim Chi Wial also became nervous. Lee emphasized that things were different in the past, they had been friends, and Bi Kyun Hyung could have shown sympathy and provided assistance, especially for his sister's sake. Bi Kyun Hyung was left speechless by Lee's accusations. Bi Kyun Hyung, in response to Lee Oryum's anger and accusations, declared that he had never considered Lee a friend, not even for a moment. He challenged how someone like Lee, an orphan without parents, could possibly become his friend. Bi Kyun Hyung asserted that they existed on entirely different social levels, and he wanted Lee to have no misconceptions about their relationship. He mentioned that he had interacted with Lee briefly out of boredom but had never thought of Lee as a friend. Lee Oryum was taken aback by Bi Kyun Hyung's harsh words. Furthermore, Bi Kyun Hyung suggested that Kim Shi Wial probably shared the same perspective as he did. He insinuated that Kim Shi Wial, coming from a privileged background, likely viewed Lee as a form of entertainment or a plaything. Bi Kyun Hyung emphasized that he genuinely didn't care whether individuals like Lee were hurt or not. Bi Kyun Hyung continued to pour disdain on Lee and his sister, dismissing them as mere orphans with nothing to gain, no matter how hard they struggled. He made it clear that he saw them as living worthless lives and considered himself so high above them that he couldn't even see them. Leo Riam was seething with anger at these words. He couldn't contain his fury any longer and launched a punch straight at Bi Kyun Hyung's face. Lee told Bi Kyun Hyung that he had initially thought Bi associated with the wrong crowd for a while, but now it was evident that Bi himself was nothing more than trash. As Bi Kyun Hyung stood up, seemingly ready to retaliate, he asked if Lee wanted an apology. Lee, undeterred, declared that he didn't need an apology and braced himself for another confrontation, throwing a punch at Bi Kyun Hyung. Bi Kyun Hyung was sent tumbling away from the impact of Leo Ryum's punch. Lee sternly told him that he had no desire for an apology from someone like him. He vowed to settle the score with Bi Kyun Hyung one way or another and asserted that someday, he would be the one looking down on Bi Kyun Hyung from a much higher position. Later that night, as Leo Ryum walked alone, Kim Shi Wial joined him, playfully putting her hand on his back and teasing him to raise his hands. She was making a bit of fun, and Lee turned to her, asking what she was up to. Inquisitively, she questioned whether he had been friends with Bi Kyun Hyung when they were young. Lee was left momentarily speechless. Kim Shi Wial admitted that she had followed him because she was concerned and unintentionally overheard their conversation, which seemed like a sensitive topic. 
she apologized for eavesdropping, but Lee reassured her that there was no need to apologize, as it wasn't an extraordinary story. He was simply embarrassed that he had once trusted someone like Bi Kyunhelm. Curious, she asked if he had been very close to Bi Kyunhelm. Lee explained that during their elementary school years, they were inseparable and practically best friends, playing together nearly every day after school. However, once they reached middle school and Bi Kyunhyun began associating with the popular kids, a divide grew between them. She asked if that's when Bi Kyunhyun started harassing him. Lee o Ryum explained that initially, Bi Kyunhyun had introduced him to the popular kids as if he wanted him to be a part of their group, but things had taken a different turn. Kim Shi we all comforted him, saying he shouldn't feel guilty about it. The one in the wrong was the perpetrator, not the victim. She emphasized that it should be the betrayer who feels guilty, not the one who had placed trust in them. This statement surprised Lee. Then, out of the blue, Kim Shi we all invited him to her house for some ramen that evening. Lee was taken aback and asked why the sudden offer. He was having trouble following the conversation. She replied that she just felt like making him some ramen and wondered if she needed a reason to do so. She also mentioned his potential lawsuit, suggesting it might be a good idea for him to enjoy a meal before things got complicated. She mentioned that she would also try to look into it, so he should come along with her. However, Lee insisted that he would handle it by himself and couldn't ask her to do that much for him. Kim Shi we all countered by saying that she wouldn't have a party member if he got arrested, making this situation important for her as well. She emphasized that this was something they needed to resolve together because it was a party quest. Lee was left speechless. Meanwhile, a girl was seen escorting the Reaper to a location. The Reaper had a blindfold on and his hands were tied. Once they arrived, a man praised her partner for successfully bringing the Reaper to this location. The Reaper, eager to see Chaos's boss with his own eyes, requested that they remove the bandana and the restraints. The man agreed to remove the bandana but decided to keep the restriction skill in place. Their boss intervened, instructing them to release the Reaper. The boss explained that since the Reaper had come all this way, it wouldn't be fitting for him to remain in handcuffs. They needed to have a proper face-to-face -face conversation. The Reaper, though not interested in having tea, acknowledged that this indicated progress, and identified the boss as the leader of chaos, the class master he had always wanted to meet at least once to see what he looked like. The boss admitted that he had also wanted to see the Reaper for a long time. The tea was ready, and the boss inquired once more if the Reaper was absolutely unwilling to drink it. He mentioned that he had prepared high-quality tea, having heard of the Reaper's visit. The boss explained that the scent of the tea leaves diminished each time the lid was opened, so he reserved it for special occasions. The Reaper, however, showed no interest in the tea leaves, stating that he didn't need them. He urged the boss to stop with the nonsense and get straight to the point. The boss, in a somewhat mocking tone, asked if it would be so bad to have a casual chat over tea. The Reaper's patience wore thin, threatening to demolish the boss's base and even suggesting breaking their alliance to eliminate the boss first. The boss commented that the Reaper indeed seemed to recklessly attack anyone, living up to his reputation as the epitome of a cliché villain. The boss expressed his admiration for Hong Kiho, stating that he enjoyed individuals like him who added an element of entertainment to an otherwise mundane world. He then revealed Hong Kiho's identity, a second-year student from Oseong High School, Class 3, known as the Murderer. This revelation left the Reaper, Hong Kiho, stunned. Fueled by anger and the desire to eliminate the boss, Hong Kiho moved forward to attack. However, the boss remained fearless and used his skill, Neil, on the Reaper, Hong Kiho. Following that, the Reaper pondered why he couldn't summon any strength. The boss then articulated that a truly great villain should possess an ambitious plan that stands apart from others' ideologies. This plan should be so noble that it can instantly dismantle the schemes of others. The boss emphasized that regardless of the Reaper's proficiency in PK or skill usage, he was ultimately a component of the game's system. The boss likened the Reaper to a villain waiting in line to vote. He then shifted the conversation to the business for which he had summoned the Reaper. The boss expressed a request and proposed that, if accepted, he would reward the Reaper by teaching him how to open a back door, a power that transcends the system. The Reaper, Hong Kiho SSI, was left momentarily speechless by the boss's words. The boss added that he didn't mind if the Reaper refused the request after hearing its details, but he advised him to provide an answer as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, Leo Riem and Kim Shi we all had arrived at Kim's house. Kim mentioned that she was going to change. Lee was surprised when he saw Kim Shi we all's house. He noticed a family picture of Kim and observed that it might have been taken during their middle school years, as she had shorter hair and appeared to be the only child. Kim returned and asked him about the food. Lee realized that their conversations had mostly revolved around the game, 
and he had never really asked her much about herself. Lee found himself pondering why a girl who lived in such a massive house would risk her life playing the game. As he watched her, he wondered what might be going through her mind. After enjoying the ramen, Lee expressed his appreciation, commenting on how good it was. Kimchi we all revealed that she always felt better when having ramen on stressful days, which was why she had made it for him. Lee couldn't help but notice her unusual kindness that day. He offered to help with the dishes, but she insisted that she could handle it herself. Curious about her family, Lee asked when her parents would be coming home. Kim Shi we all explained that they were often home late, and she wasn't sure when they'd return. She mentioned that there were rare occasions when her parents came home early, so she's usually home alone in the evenings. Lee then asked her if she had someone like a live-in maid who cooked for her. She replied that she didn't have anything like that and asked if he thought they were some noble family from the movies who ordered servants around. She explained that while they did have people who helped with housework, they didn't come every day. Lee expressed his surprise, mentioning that he had thought she would spend evenings with her family while others took care of the housework. He had never imagined her washing dishes. She told him not to make assumptions like that and emphasized that she wasn't the type of person who used her wealth to boss others around. Despite living more comfortably than most due to her privileged background, she didn't take advantage of people just because she had money. Lee listened to her words in silence. Kim then reassured him, saying that she had never thought of him as some toy she wanted to play with either. Lee realized that she had been bothered by what Bi Kyun Hyun had said earlier. He expressed his gratitude, telling her that he had never once thought she would treat him like that. From everything he had seen, she was not that kind of person. Lee reminded her of the times she had helped him when he was being harassed, saved him when he was about to be killed by a PK user, and trusted his plan during the quest. Lee continued by saying that even if others only saw her as someone with a golden spoon, he didn't see her that way. The person he had met was the labyrinth master, after all. Kim Chi we all jokingly told him that he was making her cringe so hard. Then she asked him about what he had said earlier, about never imagining her doing dishes. She pointed out that he still had some bias about her in the end. Lee clarified that he was actually going to say something else. He wanted to say that he had never imagined her wearing an apron, but now that he saw it, it looked good on her. He said he was going to say that she looked surprisingly good in it. She got speechless. After that, Bi Kyun Hyung went to have some bandages put on his nose. He met his father, who handed him a bag and mentioned that his grandmother had made it for him. Lee Kyun Hyung asked his father why he had come directly to give him the bag. His father replied that he was passing by, so he thought he would pay him a visit. Then, his father asked him about what was going on with his face. Lee Kyun Hyung replied that it's nothing. His father told him not to expect too much from him but also warned him not to make him bow to someone. Lee Kyun Hyung understood. As his father was leaving, he added that since it's only the first semester of his first year, if Lee Kyun Hyung wanted to transfer schools or study abroad, he should let him know. Bi Kyun Hyung didn't say anything but felt angry. A YouTuber is in the process of creating a YouTube video in which he is showcasing a mysterious location he visited earlier in the day. He is explaining to his viewers that an explosion occurred at this very spot some time ago, and this incident keeps recurring. He proceeds to elucidate that this phenomenon is referred to as the mill fuel hypothesis, which posits that the universe they inhabit is akin to a vast thinking board, influenced by other universes that are layered together like a mill fuel pastry. In the midst of this, a man skillfully eliminates a menacing monster. This individual is revealed to be none other than Bi Kyun Hyung. Unexpectedly, another man materializes on the scene and implores Bi Kyun Hyung not to kill emphasizing that he is, in fact, a human, not a monstrous entity. The man complimented Bi Kyun Hyung on his exceptional skill, inquiring whether he was the one who had defeated an ogre in the Cursed Forest, a feat typically requiring a team of five. He also mentioned the enticing rewards associated with ogre subjugation quests. However, Bi Kyun Hyung curtly informed him that he wasn't interested in engaging in conversation and requested him to depart. The man seemingly undeterred by Bi Kyun Hyung's dismissal, insinuated his true motive, plundering Bi Kyun Hyung's possessions. He advanced towards Bi Kyun Hyung, launching an attack utilizing his rogue skill, known as Death Drops or All Mine Robbing Skill. Yet, Bi Kyun Hyung was well prepared and executed a counterattack, employing his executioner skill with a summary execution, stun attack. The force of the strike sent the man tumbling a considerable distance, leaving him astounded by Bi Kyun Hyung's use of the executioner ultimate skill. Despite the man's desperate pleas for mercy, he emphasized the dire consequences should Bi Kyun Hyung choose to slay him on the spot. 
Beek Yoon-hyung would be branded as a PK user, incurring penalty points. Yet, Beek Yoon-hyung remained unmoved and launched an attack, resulting in the man's demise. Promptly, the system interface materialized on the scene, proclaiming Beek Yoon-hyung's temporary banishment from accessing town stores for the subsequent 56 hours. Furthermore, it cautioned that should penalty points accumulate during this penalty period, he would be forcibly relocated to Chaos Island. Suddenly, another individual made an appearance and commended Beek Yoon-hyung's actions, regarding him as quite the maverick. This man lauded Beek Yoon-hyung's willingness to take action without concern for the consequences. The man extended an offer, proposing to discuss something worthwhile with Beek Yoon-hyung at a more convenient time. Beek Yoon-hyung retorted, inquiring if the man had a death wish like that rogue he'd encountered earlier. The man quickly clarified that he harbored no such intentions. In fact, his sole desire was to unite with Beek Yoon-hyung not to engage in combat. Despite Beek Yoon-hyung's attempt to attack him, the man effortlessly repositioned himself behind Beek Yoon-hyung, catching him off guard. He disclosed his role as a recruiter for a specific guild, revealing that he had observed Beek Yoon-hyung for a considerable duration. He believed that Beek Yoon-hyung's tendencies and abilities aligned well with their guild's ethos and offered him the opportunity to interview with their guild's president and potentially join their ranks. However, Beek Yoon-hung swiftly declined, asserting his disinterest in guild membership. The man tantalizingly dangled the prospect of intriguing events before Beek Yoon-hung's eyes, such as a competition with a prize of 20 billion won or the bizarre notion of Beek Yoon-hung physically transforming into his in-game character. These revelations left Beek Yoon-hung in a state of shock, prompting him to demand further clarification. In response, the man asserted that additional details would come at a cost and beckoned Beek Yoon-hyung to visit Chaos Island if his curiosity was piqued. To learn more, the man proposed that Beek Yoon-hyung would need to eliminate all PK users on the island and ascend to the summit of the tower. He emphasized that it would require a modicum of effort on Beek Yoon-hyung's part if he truly desired to uncover something fascinating. With that, the man concluded the conversation by employing his teleportation box skill and declared that he would meet Beek Yoon-hyung on Chaos Island. Beek Yoon-hyung speculated whether the phenomenon of sudden appearance changes could be linked to Leo Ryum. Later, as Leo Ryum and Kim shi Wyal continued on their way, Kim shi Wyal shared that she had inquired with her cousin the previous night. Her cousin had assured her that as long as Lee could provide evidence of harassment by a gang of people, he wouldn't be arrested. In essence, the matter could be resolved if she testified on his behalf, alleviating his concerns about potential legal action. This news brought a sigh of relief from Lee, who confessed that the fear of going to jail had kept him awake all night. Their conversation took an unexpected turn as they stumbled upon a sports car parked in front of their school, prompting Lee to wonder if someone had recently hit the jackpot. Kim shi all playfully inquired if the flashy sports car could be a present that Lee had prepared just for her. Lee, however, dismissed this idea, explaining that it would have taken him a great deal of effort, such as defeating over a hundred black breasts, to afford such a luxury. Their discussion was interrupted as Yu Soon-ha and Kang ik ju unexpectedly crossed paths with Leo Ryum and Kim shi Wyal. Kim shi Wyal asked Lee if he knew them, and although he replied negatively, he couldn't shake the feeling that he had seen them before. This realization surprised Kim shi Wyal, who suggested that they might belong to the guild. Yu Soon-ha proposed that they skip school and go for a ride, a proposition that left Kim shi Wyal and Leo Ryum somewhat baffled. Yu seung however, had an ulterior motive. She wanted to have a conversation with them and invited them to her base. They continued their journey in the car. Kim shi Wyal expressed her concerns to Leo Ryum, questioning whether it was really safe to follow these individuals. Lee reassured her, pointing out that these people already knew their names and school, which meant they could have attacked them at any time if they wanted to. Kim remained skeptical, suggesting there was no concrete proof that they merely wanted to talk. Lee, however, believed it was worth listening to what they had to say, as it might provide them with valuable information about. They eventually arrived at a cafe. Yu Seung-ha mentioned her intention to introduce them to their guild members, but Kim recommended moving to a quieter room inside the cafe due to the noise. Yu Seung-ha commented on Kim's life experiences, acknowledging her as the daughter of a pharmaceutical company president. She assured them that she would gather everyone in one room. Kim shi we all couldn't help but wonder if Yu soon ha knew even more about them, given her earlier knowledge. Leo Ryum, on the other hand, inquired if Kim had been to this place before. Kim shi we all explained that she used to visit every summer with her parents when she was younger because her father enjoyed vacationing here. As they entered the room, Lee was taken aback to find all the members of Guild Racing already present. He remarked that their numbers were fewer than he had anticipated. 
Kim commented that considering it was a large guild, she expected there to be at least dozens of members. Yu Seung had chimed in, explaining that even though they were a large guild, not many members had been transferred. This left Lee puzzled, prompting him to ask about the meaning of transferred. Yu Seung elaborated on the phenomenon they called transfer, explaining that it involved individuals becoming their in game characters in real life. Kim Shi, we all couldn't help but wonder if Yu Seung knew the reason behind these transfers. Wu Young chimed in, stating that they didn't have the exact scientific principles, but they had been investigating by gathering opinions on the conditions of the phenomenon. Yu Seung continued, saying that they believed the common condition for the transfer phenomenon was that both Lee and Kim had to be rankers within the game's top 100. Leo Riem was taken aback and questioned if everyone in the room was in the top 100. Kim clarified that they meant rankers within the top 100. Yu Seung assured them that there was no need for surprise, as both Lee and Kim were within the top 10%. Yu Seung disclosed that Leo Riem ranked 89th and Kim Shi Weol was 47th. She pointed out that Lee and Kim Shi Weol might not place much importance on Ergosphere's game ranking, as it primarily served for personal satisfaction. She emphasized this point, especially regarding Leo Riem. He had not taken part in the team quest known as the, which could significantly boost his rank. Lee was a unique case, having entered the rankings purely through solo quests and event clearings. Furthermore, he rarely engaged in player versus player battles, which were similar to ranking battles. Leo Riem clarified to Yu Seung-ha that he didn't concern himself with rankings and admitted that he didn't particularly enjoy fighting, even in a game. Another team member raised the question of whether Lee would be of any use in real battles, as winning battles required more than just gaming skills. Hyun Sung shared that he had initially shared the same concern. The discussion continued, acknowledging that in the game, they weren't only up against monsters, but also other formidable players. They were astonished to learn that Lee had faced a Chaos Lancer, equipped only with his skills, and emerged victorious. This feat left their team members in disbelief, as Lee's win without the aid of items was extraordinary. Hyun Soon chimed in, expressing that they need not be concerned about historical rankings. Based on what he had witnessed, Lee possessed the skills to be a top-ranked player solely through his exceptional control and instincts. Losing Lee would be a significant setback for their team. Lee himself was taken aback by these remarks. Suddenly, Kim Shi Weol intervened, calling for a halt to the conversation. She had been listening as the discussion took a curious turn, and she wondered if the reason Yu Seung Ha had invited them here was to recruit them into their guild. Yu Seung Ha chuckled and admitted that she assumed their intention was clear, but apparently, it wasn't. She clarified that the primary purpose of their meeting was indeed recruitment. Based on their observations, the classes and skills of Kim and Lee would be valuable additions to their guild. This was why she had come to meet with both of them today. Particularly because they were uncertain about what lay ahead in the upcoming major event, they felt the need to strengthen their ranks. Lee inquired if she was referring to. Yu Seung Ha confirmed, saying that it would be advantageous for Kim and Lee to join the guild. This way, they could exchange information not only about quest rewards but also about the phenomenon and the game itself. Kim Chi we all inquired whether this meant there was information Yu Seung-ha hadn't disclosed yet. Yu Seung-ha responded that the only way to uncover that was by joining the guild. Nevertheless, she assured them there were other benefits beyond that. Yu Seung-ha explained that they would receive privileges that students like them typically couldn't access. Firstly, they'd provide financial support for activities required to clear monthly quests and offer medical services. They'd also grant them membership to use the hotel as their base. Moreover, they would ensure Lee and Kim's protection so that they wouldn't be targeted by chaos, referring to the island where players were penalized for PK actions in the game. Yu Seung confirmed that this was the official definition, but it was also a nickname for users who engaged in player killing with malicious intent. In reality, Chaos was a guild comprised of those who peeked in groups. Leo Riem realized that Chaos included some of the users he had encountered. Initially, he had thought it was just a few individuals acting independently, but now he saw that they were operating systematically as a guild. Yusuma then asked for their decision. She wanted to know whether they would join their guild or leave the room and pretend this meeting never occurred. Lee was deep in thought, considering the pros of joining the guild. He believed it could make the game much easier compared to their struggles as a duo. Suddenly, Kim Chi we all raised a question about what would happen to the rewards from the event if they joined. Kim Chi we all had concerns about the distribution of rewards and wishes. She wondered if only the person who placed first among the guild members would get their wish granted from the event. Yu Seung clarified that for the money, they had decided to divide it evenly among themselves. And for the wish, they would wish for something that all guild members agreed on. 
Kim then posed another question, asking what Yoo Seung Ha would do if they declined to join the guild. Yoo Seung Ha's response was straightforward, nothing. However, she warned Kim that if she happened to encounter them during the event, she should avoid them at all costs, as they were determined to win the event by any means necessary. Kim Chi we all pondered her options. Joining the guild would increase their chances of winning but require her to abandon her personal wish. On the other hand, not joining the guild to fulfill her wish would significantly reduce their chances of victory. Additionally, all these people were rankers in one of the top three guilds, which added to her dilemma. The players they were dealing with were the most experienced veterans in the game. Kim Chi we all realized that their chances of securing the first position in the event were exceedingly slim. In a game where their lives were at stake, she felt that joining the guild was her only option if she wanted to survive. However, Leo Riem had a different perspective. He firmly stated that they wouldn't join the guild if it meant giving up on their wish. Lee explained that playing the game would lose its meaning if they had to sacrifice their wish to do so. Instead, he suggested that they take on the event as a party, not as guild members. The guild members admired Lee's determination and spirit. Wu Young chuckled and mentioned that Lee seemed more ambitious than he appeared. Yu Seung-ha then asked what their wish was, curious if it had any connection to the guild's goals. In response, Leo Riem playfully declared that their wish was to create the harem kingdom of their dreams, filled with idols who matched their tastes. This unexpected revelation left everyone in shock, especially Kim Chi we all, who was both surprised and furious with Lee. Kim Chi we all scolded him angrily, questioning how he could blurt out something she had only mentioned as a joke. Lee defended himself by suggesting that if it wasn't true, she must have a dream she wanted to fulfill. Kim admitted that she did indeed have a dream. Hyun Seung, however, couldn't help but express his frustration at Lee and Kim, implying that regardless of their skills, they were still just children. Kang Ikju confidently asserted that there was no need to wait for the event. He was ready to defeat Kim and Lee right there. He expressed his disdain for Kim and Lee's supposed game objectives, suggesting that if they were playing for trivial reasons like that, they would only be a nuisance to their guild. Kang Ikju, a soul fighter ranked 14th, compared his status with that of Leo Riem, who was an Avenger ranked 89th. Hyun Soon prepared to use his skill to attack Lee, but Kim Shi we all intervened, questioning his actions. She emphasized that there was no need to resort to violence just because their recruitment attempt had failed. Yu Soon Ha apologized for the confrontation but mentioned that their guild also engaged in activities beyond recruitment. Kim inquired about their other business, prompting Yu Seung-ha to reveal that they were involved in hunting. They confronted users who might pose a threat to their guild and encouraged them to leave the game voluntarily. Lee questioned how this differed from PK, as it seemed similar to Chaos's indiscriminate attacks. Wu Young clarified that they didn't kill people like Chaos, they aimed to demoralize Lee and Kim enough for them to quit the game willingly. Other members of the guild chimed in, explaining that their hunting was akin to a one-on-one -on -one PvP battle, with the user receiving a penalty, which typically led to retirement. Lee further questioned what would happen if the loser refused to accept the penalty, to which the man responded that it didn't matter. It's actually more than enough for them to gather data about the user's skills and tendencies. Yu Seung-ha then explained that the term retiring was just a formality. They had no means to physically force users to quit the game. Consequently, they lacked the time and manpower to continuously monitor them. That's why their strategy was to completely demoralize Kim and Lee through a battle, ensuring that they wouldn't pose a threat in the future. Kim and Lee stared at them angrily. Yu Seung-ha once again asked them what they wanted to do. She proposed that if they joined their guild, they would cancel the hunt and let everything go. Lee Oriam responded that they still wouldn't join their guild. However, he suggested a wager. If he lost the hunt, he would join the guild. In return, all members of the guild would have to join their party if Yu Seung-ha lost the hunt. Yu Seung-ha questioned Lee about why they should accept his seemingly absurd conditions. In response, Leo Reem explained that they had no other way to stop them. He emphasized that even if he and Kim Shi we all lost the hunt, they had no intention of quitting or being demotivated. Their goal was to secure the first place in the event at any cost. Thus, the only effective way for Yu Seung-ha to prevent them from pursuing their goal was to force them into their guild. Everyone in the room turned their attention to Lee. Yu Seung-ha then asked Kim Shi we all if she also agreed with this decision. Kim Shi we all replied that she had never agreed to it but felt like she had no other choice. She noted that the cat was already out of the bag, so she would have to go along with it. She emphasized that she wasn't someone who would obediently grovel at someone's feet. Yu Seung-ha burst into laughter. Following this, Yu Seung-ha announced that she would accept all of their conditions. She clarified that in this one-on-one -on -one battle, the losing side would become the winning side's subordinates. Yu Seung-ha inquired whether Lee and Kim were satisfied with this arrangement. 
Both Kim and Lee confirmed their agreement with the condition. One of the guild members, a girl, asked Yu Sunga if she truly accepted the kid's terms. She questioned what would happen if the guild was indeed taken from them. Yu Sunga confidently responded that they still held the advantage in numbers, so they could reverse the situation whenever they wished. Therefore, they should allow Lee and Kim to exert all their strength. Everyone gathered at Guild S training facility, with Lee and Kang Ikju positioned in front of them. Yu Sunha explained that the battle would be a one-on-one -on -one match with specific rules, no time limit, no items, and no leaving the ground. Kim Shi we all expressed her concerns about the safety of such a battle, fearing that someone might get seriously hurt or even killed. Yu Sunha reassured her, stating that they would be using a particular item during the fight. This item would trigger when the user's health dropped to 1%, instantly restoring it to 15%. Kim Shi we all remarked that this item wasn't used much, as Yu Sunga could only carry one at a time, but she was surprised that Yu Sunga would use it in a battle like this. Yu Sunga explained that the match would end once that item was destroyed. Their guild members assured everyone that they would intervene to stop the fight if things escalated to a worst-case scenario, alleviating some concerns. Yu Sunga added that they also had a tier 1 healing class named Yun Zhang, an angel with a rank of 56, emphasizing their readiness for the battle. Leo Riam was prepared to face Kang Ikju in the fight. Kang Ikju, a soul fighter, was visibly angry with Lee. Leo Riam acknowledged that he had observed Kang Ikju's skills during their encounter at the hotel. As the battle began, Leo Riam recognized that the soul fighter had a short attack range but possessed a strong combo attack. With this knowledge, Lee strategized to maintain distance and not give Kang Ikju a chance to close in. Kang Ikju initiated an attack against Lee, but Lee initially couldn't grasp Ikju's strategy. Kang Ikju explained that his fighting style was an infighting class that relied on skill combinations and frontline combat. He pointed out that this approach wasn't limited to Avengers, soul fighters employed a similar method. Kang Ikju launched an attack using his skill, Werewolf's Claws, which placed Lee in a challenging situation. Kang Ikju then closed in an unleashed ogre kick to strike at Lee. Lee struggled to withstand this attack, but Kang Ikju soon realized that he had sustained some wounds himself. In response, Leo Riam revealed his fighting style, which involved using the skill my ancestor is watching to enhance his defense while enduring enemy attacks. He also mentioned his ability to endure attacks while seeking opportunities to counterattack. Kang Ikju began to suspect that Lee had executed a counter skill when he was hit by Ogre Kick. Kang Ikju couldn't believe that someone ranked 89th could pull off such maneuvers. Suddenly, Kang Ikju disappeared from Lee's view, and Lee understood that Kang Ikju was planning to exploit his blind spot. Just as Kang Ikju reappeared behind Lee, preparing to launch an attack, Lee managed to evade the blow and counterattacked swiftly. After this exchange, Lee anticipated that Kang Ikju might try to increase the distance and then exploit his blind spots using skill combinations. However, he was mistaken. Instead, Kang Ikju employed his skill, Forest King Possession, to attack Lee, who successfully defended against the assault. At this point, Lee decided that he didn't need to overthink the situation and focused on the battle at hand. Lee realized that Kang Ikju had an advantage in terms of range, but he believed that if he timed his attacks just right, he could overcome it. However, Kang Ikju surprised him by launching a punch instead. He explained to Lee that while the range of Lee's sword was longer, the preparation motion for his sword strikes took 0.2 seconds longer compared to preparing fists. This small difference allowed Kang Ikju to exploit the timing gap and nullify the range advantage. Lee couldn't help but feel the pressure as Kang Ikju's speed exceeded that of the lancer he had faced previously. He recognized the effectiveness of Kang Ikju's hybrid attack, incorporating Forest King possession, and was impressed by the clever use of feints to disrupt his attack timing. Lee realized that he needed to adapt to Kang Ikju's style if he wanted to gain the upper hand. With determination, he readied himself to attack. To everyone's surprise, Lee launched a punch at Kang Ikju, causing him to fall to the ground. This unexpected move shocked not only the onlookers but also Yu Siunha, who was amazed that an Avenger was using a punching attack. Lee understood that he needed to develop a new fighting style tailored for combat against individuals. He envisioned a dual style, combining his swordsmanship techniques in one hand with martial artist-style fist strikes in the other. This innovative approach aimed to give him an edge in battles like the one he was currently engaged in. As the spectators observed the battle, Kang Ikju stood up and admitted that Lee's unexpected punch had caught him off guard. Kim Shi we all realized that Kang Ikju had only lost his balance, so he hadn't taken much damage. She noted that for a class like the Avenger, which typically fought with swords, using fists was akin to fighting completely unarmed. 
Undeterred, Liu Ri impressed forward and continued his assault on Kang Ikju. The fight raged on, but then Liu Ri unleashed his skill, strong attack, catching Kang Ikju off guard. Kang Ikju didn't manage to defend against the attack and was injured. One of the onlookers commented that it seemed like Kang Ikju was suddenly being pushed back. Liu Ri realized that the significance of this moment wasn't just the damage inflicted but the fact that he had gained another weapon his fists, to complement his sword skills. Li continued his relentless assault on Kang Ikju, leaving wounds with each strike. He executed his skill, Ancestor Punch, which landed a powerful blow on Kang Ikju. Kang Ikju, struggling to comprehend Li's unorthodox attacking strategy, grew increasingly nervous. Li swiftly moved to Kang Ikju's back, launching an attack using his skill, Revenge is a Raging Fire. Kang Ikju found it difficult to defend against this assault. Li was determined to secure victory in this fight. Wu Yung commented on Li's strategy, noting that he had become more skilled at dealing burst damage while effectively countering his opponent with punches and counter skills. He also observed that Li's attack speed seemed faster than before, likely due to Li investing status points into dexterity that he had received as a reward. Both Kang Ikju and Liu Riem fought with all their might. Kang Ikju, initially fueled by anger, suddenly collapsed and fell to his knees. Kim Shi Wiao, puzzled, asked if Li had won. However, Yu Seung clarified that the battle was far from over, leaving Kim Shi we all confused. Yu Seung then turned to Zhang and asked how many seconds had passed. Zhang replied that 342 seconds had elapsed, and it should be almost time. Kang Ikju, on the verge of defeat, suddenly rose to his feet, invoking the Soul Fighter Ultimate, the advent of an Elder God. Li was astonished by this development, while Kim Shi we all found it hard to believe. The girl from the guild explained that it wasn't about the activation condition of the skill, but rather the opponent. Kang Ikju had calculated that his opponent was strong enough to challenge him for over five minutes, even with the handicap of activating his ultimate skill five minutes later. This acknowledgement spoke volumes about Li's strength. She went on to explain that Kang Ikju had been fighting with all his might from the very beginning and hadn't underestimated Li and Kim just because they were younger. Kang Ikju activated his skill and admitted to Li that he was strong. He recognized that Li was someone who could easily take on a hundred others if he joined their guild. Kang Ikju declared that he would end the fight in just five attacks. Kang Ikju launched his first attack on Li, sending him flying. He followed up with a relentless barrage of the second and third attacks. Li struggled to comprehend how to counter this assault. He realized that his passive skill was sealed by the Elder God, preventing him from using his linked ultimate. He understood that if he continued to take hits like this, the game would be over. Li desperately needed to change the course of the fight. As Kang Ikju prepared for his fourth attack, an idea struck Li. However, Kang Ikju pressed on with his relentless assault. Li used his barrier skill, Devotion to Revenge, to defend against the fourth attack, but Kang Ikju scoffed, dismissing it as useless. Li was sent sprawling once again. Yu Xiongha, observing the battle, noted that Li was not only wasting time but also allowing Kang Ikju to rack up his number of attacks. She explained that the Soul Fighter class had both a barrier and a defend break attribute. She grimly predicted that the game would end with Kang Ikju's next attack. Li, though battered, stood his ground. As Kang Ikju prepared to launch his fifth and potentially decisive attack, everyone watched intently. To their astonishment, Kang Ikju was shocked to discover that Li had defended against his fifth attack by utilizing his skill. Li wasted no time in explaining to Kang Ikju why he had been able to defend against his attacks. He noted that Kang's attack patterns were overly simplistic, making it easy for him to predict his moves. Kang Ikju was taken aback, unaware of the hidden strategy Li had kept up his sleeve. Li revealed that he had been saving a plan right from the beginning, a chance to turn the Soul Fighter's ultimate skill against him. This was why he had allowed himself to be hit by Kang Ikju's fourth attack, as it was only then that Kang would resort to a straight punch for his final move. With a calculated precision, Li unleashed his skill and the Soul Master Ultimate in a devastating combination attack against Kang Ikju. The force of the assault sent Kang Ikju hurtling backward in agony. To everyone's shock, the mysterious doll suddenly appeared and then vanished, leaving Kang Ikju bewildered and in pain. Liu Riem emerged victorious from the fight, and Kim Shi we all rushed to embrace him, filled with joy at their unexpected win. She admitted to Lee that she had thought he was done for when he took that fourth attack, but he had pulled off a remarkable victory. Meanwhile, the guild members turned to Yu Seungha, inquiring about her plans. They were curious if she was seriously considering entering this high schooler party. Yu Seungha chuckled and confessed that she hadn't expected Kang Ikju to lose, so she wasn't entirely sure yet. 
She suggested waiting to hear what Lee and Kim had to say before making any decisions. Yu Suma considered the various possibilities. If Kim and Lee had specific demands like money, items, or information, there was still room for negotiation. They could find a compromise to satisfy their requests and send them on their way. However, if Kim and Lee were genuinely planning to absorb their guild, Yu Seung-ha realized that things might take a more drastic turn. In that case, she was prepared to use her hidden blade if necessary, even if it meant getting her hands dirty to protect the guild. Yu Jong employed his angel skill, second chance given by an angel, on both Leo and Kang Ikju. This skill immediately restored their health, defense, and increased their attack by 20%. Leo Riem recognized it as an angel's healing skill and mentioned how healers could reach such advanced classes through proper advancement. Yu Jong explained that although healers were often overlooked due to the difficulty of leveling up solo, they could become top-tier classes when growing with skilled party members. Leo Riem humorously admitted that he had figured his party members were subpar and that it wasn't the healer's fault. Yu Seung Ha observed that the battle cleanup was nearly complete and asked Lee and Kim what they wanted to do next, reminding them of the penalty. She inquired if they still intended to become her subordinates, as Lee had previously suggested. Kim Shi We all replied that they had been discussing it. Kim proposed a change to the penalty, suggesting that their guild name be altered to and that all members must get tattoos featuring gothic lettering, each 72 points in size. This condition surprised all the guild members, who anxiously looked to Yu Seung Ha for a decision. Leo Riem then suggested an alternative, forming an alliance. He admitted that he had initially proposed them becoming subordinates but clarified that he didn't want to forcibly take over someone else's guild. Lee emphasized the importance of teamwork in guilds and expressed a desire not to engage in conflict with all of them. He proposed forming an alliance where they could mutually assist each other. Yu Seung-ha questioned Lee about the possibility of becoming enemies based on the event's details, to which Lee responded that it didn't matter. He expressed confidence that if it came to that, they would defeat them all, just as they did today, and secure the first place. Yu Seung-ha was initially surprised by Lee's confidence, but couldn't help but laugh. She accepted the proposal to become allies, and Lee expressed his readiness to work with her. Yu Seung-ha suggested exchanging contact information anticipating there would be much to discuss. Kim Chi Will, although Lee was often at the front due to being the main damage dealer, reminded Yu Seung Ha that she was the party leader and offered to exchange contact information with her. Yu Seung Ha expressed her preference for talking to Lee Oriam, citing her comfort in conversing with men. This caused Kim Chi Will to become angry and insist that Yu Seung Ha should talk to her instead. Lee observed the situation and had a feeling that the alliance might be on the verge of breaking. Kang Ikju offered a word of caution, advising Lee to be vigilant against chaos during their quests. He mentioned a tragic incident where the 34th rank in their guild was killed in a gang attack by chaos. Furthermore, recent information indicated that chaos was increasing their numbers. Yusuma then proposed the idea of organizing a group dinner as a means of sharing information. However, Lee declined the invitation, explaining that he needed to prepare dinner for his sister on that particular day. They rescheduled the dinner, with Yu Seung-ha promising to text Lee the exact time and location. Kim became angry with Yu Seung-ha once more. Lee remarked that things had gone reasonably well. Kim Shi we all agreed, stating that while it wasn't a perfect resolution, it had been more or less settled. She expressed concern about the organized nature of PK users, as she had known about individual PKers but not organized groups. Lee advised them to complete as many quests as possible and quickly improve their skills to compete with Raisin. Then Leo Riem brought up a question, asking whether formal wear was necessary for dining at a hotel restaurant, something he had seen in dramas. She was left speechless. In Ergosphere Online, on Chaos Island, Beak Yoon Hyung was locked in combat with the Chaos. He systematically eliminated them one by one, displaying his formidable skills. Then, Beak Yoon Hyung unleashed his Dragon Killer skill, a devastating attack that wiped out the remaining Chaos. Following this triumphant battle, the man who had presented him with a proposal appeared. He commended Beak Yoon Hyung for his swift progress. Considering his current level, the man had anticipated it would take Beak Yoon Hyung longer to reach this point on Chaos Island from its starting location. The man held a box containing a mask and asked the mask for its opinion on the matter. The mask responded by stating that if Beak Yoon Hyung's skills were lacking, he could always enter a flow state to compensate. Encouraged by this, the man told Beak Yoon Hyung that his next task was to ascend the tower, urging him to give it his all. Meanwhile, Kim Shi Weol and Leo Riem were having dinner with members of the Racing Guild in a restaurant. Yu Seung inquired about how their party had come together. Lee explained that he needed information about the situation, 
and Kim required a primary damage dealer, so they teamed up. Yusumha mentioned that her guild had been in a similar situation since their sudden transfer to this world and the subsequent emergence of extraordinary events. Kim Shi we all asked if the guild members who hadn't been transferred had said anything about their situation. They must have been curious about the transfer phenomenon. Yusumha explained that they hadn't informed the other guild members about the phenomenon. Instead, she had instructed them to contact her if anything unusual occurred during their gameplay. After she had completed her first quest following the transfer, she had seemingly forgotten everything about the game world, as she became captivated by the events unfolding in this new reality. Leo Riam asked Yusunga if she was primarily interested in the quest rewards, to which she responded that it was a bit more complex than that. Lee didn't quite grasp the meaning behind her words. Just then, Jian joined them, and Yusunga introduced her to Kim and Lee as their primary damage dealer. Yusunga asked Shin Jian if she could show them a photo of herself before being transferred. Shin Jian took out her phone and displayed the photo, which shocked Kim and Lee. In the photo, she appeared to be badly injured, with her fibula shattered into pieces due to a traffic accident involving a truck. She mentioned that the doctors had informed her that she wouldn't be able to walk or run again. Yusunga then explained that everything had changed after the transfer, as Shin Jian was now able to walk, move, and even jump. She expressed her fascination with the system's power, which could make the seemingly impossible become reality. Yusunga added that if they could decipher the principles behind this power, they might be able to change the world. That would be a new world without terminal diseases or sorrowful people, Leo Riem commented. He then asked if Guild Raisin's wish was to uncover the principle of the game's system. Yusunga confirmed this, acknowledging that it might be against the rules, similar to wishing for a wish-granting lamp. She went on to inquire about something from Lee and Kim. She asked if, while clearing quests or battling monsters, they had ever come across a black door. Kim Shi we all asked Lee if he didn't mention seeing a peculiar door last time. Shin Jian expressed excitement upon hearing this. Kim inquired about the nature of this door, to which Yu Sunga replied that they weren't entirely certain either. They have learned about it incidentally while interrogating the chaos. According to their information, this black door was a passage leading to the unimplemented next stage of the game they used to play, a path to advance further into the transcendent class, a backdoor of sorts. This revelation left Lee startled. Kim Shi we all engaged in battle with the monster, using her skill to attack it. After her attack, she called upon Leo Riem to deliver the finishing blow. Leo Riem swiftly executed the monster by utilizing the effects of his item skill, dispatching the creature with ease. During this moment, a flashback resurfaced in their minds, reminding them of their conversation from the previous night regarding the mysterious black door. Leo Riem reiterated his belief that the black door led to the transcendent class, initially assuming it was merely a spawning point for monsters. Yusunga interjected, mentioning that they were not entirely certain whether the information about the black door, circulated by chaos, was accurate. Accurate. However, considering the existence of aberrance, it was not entirely implausible. Curious about the term, Kim Shi we all asked what aberrance were, seeking clarification on this unfamiliar concept. The girl from the guild explained that aberrance were creatures resembling monsters from the game, such as the swift wolf Waham that Kim and Lee had encountered previously. However, these aberrants had unique abilities, or in some cases, they were entirely new beings that had never existed within the game's framework. This revelation led to the possibility that users could evolve beyond the limits set by the game. As they discussed this, Leo Riem reflected on encountering a monster that was entirely unfamiliar, speculating that it had emerged from the mysterious black door. Yusuma then introduced the girl as Kim Rimi, identifying her as a magic gunner in their guild. Kim Shi we all inquired about how to open the mysterious black door. Yusumha admitted that they hadn't fully unraveled that mystery yet, and it appeared that even the members of Chaos were not well informed about it. Shin Jian shared her perspective, suggesting that the key might reside within their consciousness. She recounted her initial struggles after being transferred, where her movements resembled her real-life limitations. But once she embraced her game avatar identity, her mobility improved. This led her to speculate that the key to the black door might indeed be tied to their consciousness. Leo Riem shared a sense of familiarity with this concept, but when Kim Shi we all asked if he had a similar experience of being broken, he responded in the negative. Yu Xiumha, however, deemed their information sharing a success, confirming their certainty about the existence of the enigmatic black door. Yu Xiumha recognized that they had a user right in front of them who might have the potential to open the elusive black door. She extended an invitation to Leo Riem, inquiring if he was still interested in joining their guild. 
However, Lee declined the offer. Kim Chi Wall, feeling a surge of jealousy and frustration at what she perceived as Yu Sung Ha's flirtation with Lee Oh Ryum, vented her irritation, suggesting that she should eliminate them all through player killing. This sudden outburst surprised Lee, who wondered why Kim was reacting this way. Following the flashback, the system congratulated Kim and Lee for successfully completing the quest by defeating five greedy spider and Kyo. Kim then asked Lee about the nature of the monsters they had just faced, to which Lee confirmed that they were not aberrants and rather straightforward adversaries. He attributed their success partly to the high-grade items they had obtained from their previous encounter with Wahong, specifically the Ring of Inevitability and proof of a strong heart. Kim also expressed her satisfaction with the items she had received, namely Angel Wings and Thread of Connection. They also received an item that seemed somewhat frivolous, Matchless Beauty's eyelashes. Kim suggested that they could trade it for something they needed in the future. Then, the system made a special announcement directed at Leo Rium. It conveyed that Lee had earned the right to challenge an X quest by successfully completing the previous quest without taking any damage. The system explained that an X quest was a challenging mission designed to test Lee's resolve and determination. Completing it would result in a unique reward, different from the usual monetary rewards, items, or random boxes. Kim Chi we all expressed her surprise, as she had never heard of this type of quest before. Lee inquired if it was similar to record-breaking missions often featured in events. The system then asked Lee Oriam about his preferences, while Kim voiced her hesitation about undertaking a quest without knowing the specific reward. Kim Chi we all questioned whether it was wiser to pursue quests with clearly defined rewards rather than taking risks like this. Lee Oriam pondered for a moment and decided they should give the quest a try. He speculated that the special reward might provide valuable information perhaps related to Horizon or the game itself. He acknowledged that this could be wishful thinking but believed the special reward would offer something unattainable through normal quests. Even if they didn't immediately need it, they could hold on to it as a bargaining chip for future negotiations with other party members or guilds. After their discussion, Kim Chi we all was ready to embark on this X quest. Later, Leo Rium found himself alone, checking his phone, realizing that tonight was the night of the quest. He concluded that he didn't need to sneak out since his sister was working the night shift. Suddenly, Han Sajung appeared. Han Sajung asked Lee if he wasn't heading back with Kim Shi we all today, and Lee explained that Kim had a consultation to attend, so she told him to go ahead without her. Han Sajung then brought up their relationship, suggesting that they might be in love or something similar. Lee clarified that there was nothing romantic between him and Kim. Han Sajung expressed surprise, stating that her intuition was usually spot on. She even mentioned that she had correctly sensed Bi Kyun Hyung's decision to transfer schools. This revelation startled Lee, and he inquired about Bi Kyun Hyung's school transfer. Han Sajung explained that many had assumed Bi Kyun Hyung was absent or worse because he hadn't been at school for some time. However, she had learned from the teacher's room that he was simply transferring schools, as he had planned. Leo Rium, feeling somewhat indifferent about Bi Kyun Hyung's situation, decided it wasn't his concern. Han Sajun persisted, urging Lee to think about Bi Kyun Hyung because they were close friends. Lee firmly responded that they were not close friends in the slightest. Han Sajun appeared surprised by Lee's response, and after their brief conversation, they parted ways. Later that night, Leo Rium and Kim Shi we all embarked on their quest. They arrived at a location near their school and were informed by the system that the quest would begin in three minutes. They needed to choose their objectives for this time trial quest, which required them to hunt eight enemies within a 15-minute time limit. Lee expressed some annoyance with the quest but also confidence in his abilities to complete it. Kim Chi we all cautioned that since these enemies might be aberrants, they needed to be cautious as aberrants could unexpectedly employ unusual skills. Lee suggested that this quest appeared to be a speed-focused one and proposed using some speed-enhancing items. Kim Chi we all shared her fondness for the story from the past. Lee was curious about it, but their conversation was interrupted by the sudden appearance of a monster. Kim was surprised that the monster had appeared even before the quest officially started. Despite this, they proceeded towards the monster and encountered the Ashen Kingdom's outcast prince. Lee swiftly attacked the first monster using his skill and sliced it in half. He proudly informed Kim that he had taken down one monster. Just as he finished, another monster emerged before him. Lee reacted swiftly, swinging his sword to slay the second monster. Meanwhile, Kim Shi we all was on the lookout for the remaining monsters. Suddenly, she spotted three of them closing in on her position. The monsters advanced menacingly but Kim was undaunted. 
she unleashed her skills and, dealing a devastating blow that eliminated all three monsters at once. Following this, she employed her skill to finish off the remaining foes one by one, successfully vanquishing all three. Lee and Kim maintained communication through their microphones, and after the battle, Lee noted that only one monster remained. Kim Chi we all suggested that she would use her watchtower skill to try and locate the last monster. She advised Lee to do the same, suggesting that they both search for the elusive foe. Lee considered the nature of the monster, reasoning that it was the type to attack as soon as it spotted an enemy. Therefore, if it was nearby, it would have likely charged at him immediately. Lee began scouring the area in search of the last monster. He decided to inquire about the remaining time in the quest and ask the system. The system promptly replied that they had 12 minutes and 46 seconds left to complete the quest. Lee realized that since these monsters weren't a barons, it wouldn't take long to defeat it once they found it. Both Kim and Lee intensified their efforts in the hunt for the elusive creature. Suddenly, Lee's keen eyes spotted the elusive monster. He swiftly informed Kim that he had located the final target and intended to handle it himself. Lee readied himself for the encounter and the monster locked eyes with him. Without hesitation, Lee unleashed his devastating skill, launching a relentless attack that quickly dispatched the creature. After the deed was done, Lee cautioned Kim that he should only use such a skill when absolutely necessary due to its potentially chaotic nature. Thinking they had completed their task, Lee and Kim prepared to choose their reward and head home. However, as Lee attempted to select their reward, he was shocked to discover that the timer was still running. Puzzled, he turned to the system for an explanation. The system revealed that the quest was not over because Kim Shi Weol and Leo Riem had only hunted seven out of eight monsters. To their surprise, the last monster emerged from the mysterious black door, signaling that the true challenge was far from finished. Lee was taken aback by the sudden appearance of the black door. The mysterious monster spoke enigmatically, mentioning Atlas and referring to their destination as Utopia, the Horizon. Then, to Lee's bewilderment, the creature dissolved into the water before his eyes. Lee couldn't help but wonder if the monster had transformed into water or used some kind of water-based camouflage. His mind racing, Lee turned to Kim Shi Weol and asked if she recalled the entire story of the quest. Kim Shi Weol recounted that in the story, the Ashen Kingdoms had fallen due to sacrilege, and the princes had fled in search of their utopia, the Horizon. As Lee pondered this information, a new group of monsters materialized behind him. It occurred to him that these quests were not randomly generated, rather, they seemed to be continuations of the game's unfinished stories, and there was likely more to this quest than met the eye. The monster launched an attack on Lee, but he skillfully defended against it. Lee's mind was racing, realizing that if they could determine the nature of this aberrant monster, they might gain valuable insights about the horizon it had mentioned. As they continued to battle, Lee had a strategic idea. Leo Riem quickly instructed the system to open the battle preparation page and initiated an exchange. He offered the high-grade item he had received earlier, the, in exchange for the. The system promptly fulfilled Lee's request, and the exchange was completed, potentially giving them an advantage in their ongoing battle. Lee found himself locked in a fierce battle with the monstrous entity, the. Suddenly, a colossal foot descended from above, threatening to crush him. However, Lee displayed agility and narrowly avoided the crushing blow. The Guardian was relentless, launching another attack at Lee, who was determined to defend himself against this formidable foe. As Lee continued to fend off the relentless assaults, he couldn't help but notice that the monster's health bar was significantly larger than that of the previous creatures they had encountered. With just 2 minutes and 48 seconds remaining, Leo Riem pondered how they could defeat this powerful adversary. Leo Riem continued his intense battle with the formidable. Determination replaced panic as he analyzed the situation. He noted that the monster's defense was only marginally higher than that of a Balrog, a familiar adversary. His concern shifted to his own damage output. If he could maximize it, he believed he could defeat the Guardian within the time limit. With precision and speed, Lee attacked the monster, severing its two arms. However, his shock was palpable as he watched those severed limbs regrow before his eyes. This creature, with its three heads, unleashed a powerful energy blast from its gaping maws. Lee managed to narrowly defend himself, then ascended to the top of the monster, understanding that he needed to disable parts of its body first to prevent it from counterattacking. Lee unleashed a relentless barrage of strikes. He combined his skills in a whirlwind of destruction before culminating with his skill, Vengeful Spirit's Rampage, in a final, devastating blow. Following his devastating attack, the monster suffered significant damage. Lee saw a glimmer of hope, believing that if he could maintain this level of energy, they could still clear the quest. He pressed on with another attack, 
pouring all his strength into it. But to his dismay, it seemed ineffective. Kim Shi Weol's voice broke the tense silence, announcing that the time allotted for the quest had expired. The monster vanished, leaving them in uncertainty about the consequences of their apparent failure. Li anxiously asked Kim what would happen next, fearing the worst. Kim Shi Weol, however, remained resolute. She reminded Li that neither of them had ever failed a quest before, and they had never given up either, so the outcome was uncertain. Just as uncertainty clouded their thoughts, the system reappeared, delivering its verdict. Regrettably, Kim Shi Weol and Li Oriam had indeed failed the quest, but the system acknowledged their achievement of completing over 50% of the quest. They were granted another opportunity to complete the quest, scheduled for the next 12 hours, specifically in the afternoon rather than at night. Lee expressed his reluctance to proceed. When Kim inquired about his reasons, Leo Riem explained his concerns. Until now, quests had occurred late at night when there were few innocent civilians around. However, in the afternoon, many people would be out and about. Lee worried that if the quest unfolded on a busy street, it could endanger dozens, if not hundreds, of innocent lives. He believed they should not take such risks merely for the sake of a quest. Kim Shi we all countered, suggesting that they could defeat all the monsters before any harm came to civilians. However, after contemplating the potential consequences, she ultimately agreed with Leo Riem. Even if a single person were to die as a result of their actions, it would lead to a significant problem. Kim Shi we all suggested giving up on the quest. She admitted that failing the quest had left her feeling somewhat disheartened, and she asked Lee to buy her a strawberry milk and a spicy chicken burger the next day to lift her spirits. Lee Oriam agreed to this plan and noted that even though they had failed the quest, they had learned that Horizon was connected to the game's storyline, which was valuable information. He suggested that they review the game's storyline until the next quest. The following day at school, Han Sajun approached Kim Shi Weol and inquired about her plans after school. Kim mentioned that she intended to chat with Lee for a while before heading home. Han Sajun proposed going shopping together, but Kim suggested they enjoy some delicious food instead. Han Sajun agreed and said she would join them after work. Later, Kim Shi Weol and Lee Oriam were standing together, with Lee engrossed in reading about Swift Wolf Waham and the story behind Waham's teleportation skill. Lee Oriam continued to read the story about Swift Wolf Waham. It recounted how Waham, who had delivered a divine message to a shaman, had fallen in love with her. One day, Waham had slain a group of thugs who were planning to harm the shaman, violating the taboo against murder. As a consequence, he was imprisoned in the 46th floor underground prison. However, God had sympathized with Waham's deep feelings for the shaman and had promised him the ability to visit her. Kim Shi Weol quickly connected the dots, suggesting that the promised ability must be the teleportation skill. Leo Riem agreed, noting that in the game, the story continued with Waham breaking out of prison due to his yearning for the shaman, leading players to confront and subjugate him. Kim Shi Weol mused that it seemed like this storyline was continuing in real life, emphasizing that the stories she had explored were all connected to the real world in some way. Kim Shi Weol pondered whether this meant that the main storyline of the game was also continuing in real life. Leo Riem shared that he had also investigated this, but he hadn't found much information on it. The primary narrative of the game revolved around heroes and monsters bestowed with the power of the god, appearing in the god's land Ergosphere. He went on to mention that one intriguing detail had caught his attention during his research. When NPCs in the game referred to God, they all seemed to be pointing to the black hole in the sky. Kim Shi we all questioned what was so peculiar about that, suggesting it was just part of the game's lore. In response, Lee explained that he wasn't entirely sure, but black holes were sometimes considered pathways to other universes. He believed this might be a clue related to the ongoing event. Kim Shi we all expressed her uncertainty, stating that there were already too many storylines to consider, and she didn't think she could handle adding another layer to their thoughts. Just as she was contemplating this, she received a message from Han Sajung, indicating that she had to leave. Before Kim left, Lee inquired about whether they should share the information they had gathered with the Raisin Guild. Kim's response was that they didn't need to share this information with them. However, the system unexpectedly intervened, announcing that the X-Quest was starting in five minutes and asking if they accepted. Leo Riem and Kim Shi we all were taken aback by this, as they had already declined the quest earlier. The system clarified that another user had accepted the X-Quest they had initially declined. However, since the quest was originally designated for Kim and Lee, the system was offering them another chance to undertake the quest. The system presented them with a choice, accepting the quest would turn it into a competition quest, allowing them to earn rewards, 
but refusing would be seen as intruding on someone else's quest. Leorium was curious about the identity of the user who had accepted the quest, but the system didn't provide any information. In response, Kim Shi we all decided to accept the quest, which surprised Li. She emphasized that since the quest had already started, their primary focus should be on clearing it as quickly as possible. Leo Riem suggested that if she encountered the person who had accepted the quest, she should inform him. He expressed concern that this user might be a PK or Chaos member. With their decision made, they accepted the quest and were transported to the quest location, where they noticed someone else in the lobby, going alone. Two students were walking in a school lobby, chatting, gossiping, and sharing laughs. Suddenly, they heard an unusual noise and turned their attention to the lobby, but there was nothing to be seen. One of the students suggested they head home, but before they could react, his companion was struck by an unseen force, sent flying, and met a tragic end. Shocked by the horrifying sight, the remaining boy watched as a menacing monster materialized before him, poised to strike. In the nick of time, Leo Riem intervened, slaying the monster and saving the boy's life. Leo Riem was taken aback by the sight of the lifeless student. He urged the other boy to flee, emphasizing the danger within the school premises. The surviving student was in a state of shock, gazing at the colossal monster in disbelief. Leo Riem couldn't help but think that he and the monster were perhaps invisible to ordinary people. Leo Riem found himself in a challenging situation as he realized there was little he could do to evacuate the people within the school. However, just as despair began to set in, the school's emergency bell rang out. Kim Shi we all appeared and informed Lee that she had triggered the fire alarm, prompting an evacuation. She proposed that they join forces to search for the monsters. As they combed through the area, Kim inquired about their plan. Lee explained that this time, they couldn't afford to split up, they needed to work together to defeat the variant they had encountered previously within the time limit. Suddenly, they stumbled upon three monsters. Kim Chi we all initiated the attack with her skill, the voice beyond the labyrinth, while Leo Riem brandished his sword to engage them. To their horror, they discovered that two more students had fallen victim to the monsters. Lee observed that the monsters had already taken the lives of several students, and it hadn't been long since they initiated the quest. Suddenly, Kim Shi we all alerted him that the monsters were upstairs. Determined to investigate, Lee urged Kim to follow him. They discovered a frightened girl sitting alone, with two menacing monsters looming over her. Without hesitation, Leo Riem sprang to her defense, intercepting the monster's attacks. He instructed Kim to engage the monsters, and she promptly used her skill, Thorn Trap, to eliminate them. Lee then implored the girl to flee to safety, but he soon realized she couldn't hear him. She was in tears as she ran off. Deciding they had dealt with all the monsters in this location, Lee suggested they proceed to the main building. However, Kim Shi we all remained motionless, unresponsive to Lee's calls. As he approached her, he was horrified to discover Han Sa Jung's lifeless body. Kim Shi we all informed Lee that Han Sa Jung had said she was waiting at the front gate. Leo re-emerged Kim to compose herself, assuring her that Han Sa Jung might still be alive. He suggested using points or recovery skills to save her, even if it resulted in penalties or the loss of their rewards. Lee emphasized that he was willing to face any consequences alongside her, and urged her to save Han Sa Jung without worrying about penalties or quests. Kim Chi we all concurred with Lee's decision. However, Leo Riem recognized the pressing time constraint, considering the intricate layout of the school building. He told Kim that he couldn't wait for her to heal people and explained his plan to head to the main building while she attended to Han Sacha. Kim Shi we all then insisted that Lee take something with him. Perplexed, Lee inquired about this item. She revealed that it was one of the high-grade items she had obtained previously. Kim intended to exchange it for something else because its abilities didn't appear very useful. Nevertheless, she believed it could prove valuable in situations like the present one, ensuring that Lee could defeat all the monsters, including the variant. Leo Riem agreed and assured Kim Chi we all that he would rejoin her shortly. He proceeded to the main building where a lone monster was making its way. With swift action, Lee eliminated this monster, leaving only the variant monster to deal with. Now, they had dispatched seven monsters, with just the variant remaining. Lee embarked on an intense search for the elusive variant monster, determined to complete their mission. After a thorough search, he finally spotted the variant. Preparing himself for the encounter, Lee moved in for the attack, unleashing his powerful skill, Vengeful Spirit's Rampage. The variant retaliated, engaging Lee in a fierce battle. Despite the variant's counterattacks, Lee continued to press his assault, employing his skill, Revenge is a Raging Fire. 
The struggle between them was intense, with only 30 seconds remaining in the quest. Lee knew that he had to defeat this variant monster with his next attack to complete the quest successfully. He made sure to activate his passive skill, rendering him invulnerable while boosting his damage. Additionally, he utilized the dragon soul item that Kim Shi we all had given him, which multiplied his damage output by five times. With this immense power, Lee prepared himself for the decisive strike. He lunged forward and launched an attack on the variant monster, cleaving it into two pieces. Lee believed that he had accomplished the task and successfully finished the quest. However, his triumph was short-lived, as he was suddenly ambushed by an unexpected assailant. To his shock, it was Beek Yunhyung who had launched the attack. Beek Yunhyung found himself lying on the ground, gradually regaining consciousness. As he came to, a man approached him, offering congratulations for his rapid ascent of the Chaos Tower. The man seemed intrigued and inquired about how Beek Yunhyung felt now that he had become both the youngest and strongest PK user. Beek Yunhyung, more concerned about understanding the changes in himself and Leo Ryum, asked the man to shed light on how he could become a real-life game character and the nature of Lee's transformation. The man responded by suggesting that there might be someone in Beek Yunhyung's real life who had undergone a process known as translation. Beek Yunhyung, unfamiliar with the term, asked for an explanation. The man, realizing the complexity of the concept, decided to simplify it for Beek Yunhyung, comparing it to a term borrowed from molecular biology. The man tried to simplify the concept, explaining that it was akin to assembling individual blocks following a manual. However, Beek Yunhyung was still struggling to grasp the meaning, realizing he might have started with a more basic explanation. The man clarified that this place was not merely a virtual reality game but an entirely different universe on its own. He went on to explain that this universe had been disguised as a 3D video game, designed to be familiar to those living in the three-dimensional world. Lee Kyunhyung was left utterly speechless and appeared ready to leave. The man questioned his actions, asking what he was doing. Lee Kyunhyung bluntly stated that he didn't have time for such absurd stories. Undeterred, the man ran his hand across his body, presumably about to reveal something significant. Beek Yunhyung was utterly baffled by the man's actions. The man continued, stating that Beek Yunhyung's flow rate was at 87.8%, warning him that he might even end up dying. Beek Yunhyung stood there, rendered speechless by the shocking revelation. The man, however, seemed indifferent, asserting that it wouldn't be his fault, luck just wasn't on their side. Then, abruptly, the man killed Beek Yunhyung, promising to see him on the other side, alive. Following this disturbing event in the virtual world, Beek Yunhyung found himself feeling extremely nervous in his real life. He hastily removed his VR headset and began coughing. To his surprise, he saw a man standing in front of him. The man asked Beek Yunhyung how he was feeling, and Beek Yunhyung, still shaken, inquired about the man's identity. He asked if the man was also a user, to which the man responded that he didn't refer to himself as a user but was, in fact, one of the five creators of the game. The man revealed himself to be the CEO of Intohol Software, adding a layer of mystery to the situation. Afterward, Beek Yunhung launched an attack on Lee, his tone bitter as he accused Lee of having enjoyed his unique abilities in the past. Beek Yunhung gloated that, unfortunately for Lee, he now possessed those same abilities. Lee remained composed, listening to Beek Yunhung's taunts. Beek Yunhung went on to suggest that Lee must be angry about losing his sole advantage. However, Lee interrupted him, expressing his disinterest in how Beek Yunhyung had acquired his newfound power. The only thing Lee wanted to know was whether Beek Yunhyung was the one who accepted the quest. To Lee's astonishment, Beek Yunhyung confirmed that he was indeed the one who accepted the quest. Lee voiced his dismay, emphasizing that innocent people had lost their lives due to Beek Yunhyung's actions. Beek Yunhyung, seemingly unfazed, argued that he hadn't directly killed those innocent people. Leo Riem's fury drove him to launch a furious attack on Beek Yunhyung. Anger fueled his strikes, and Beek Yunhyung struggled to defend himself against the relentless assault. Beek Yunhyung then unleashed his skill in an attempt to counter Lee's aggression. However, Lee managed to fend off the attack and retaliated with a powerful counter-strike that caused Beek Yunhyung to cry out in pain. Desperate to protect himself, Beek Yunhyung resorted to his ultimate guillotine Robespierre skill, striking at Lee with a devastating blow. Lee valiantly defended against the attack, but not without sustaining some injuries. Undeterred, Lee pressed on, employing his skill to attack Beek Yunhyung. This time, Beek Yunhyung successfully defended against Lee's assault. Nevertheless, the battle raged on, with Beek Yunhyung launching another attack on Lee. After Lee managed to defend against the attack, he swiftly countered, delivering a forceful kick to Beek Yunhyung's face that sent him tumbling to the ground. 
Leo Riam couldn't contain his disgust and frustration as he confronted Bi Kyun Hyung. He expressed his newfound realization that Bi Kyun Hyung was not merely a delinquent but something far more sinister, a true monster. Memories of their childhood flashed through Lee's mind, fueling his determination to confront Bi Kyun Hyung for his actions. He closed his eyes momentarily, gathering his resolve, and then launched an attack on his adversary. However, Lee's assault was interrupted by the sudden appearance of a skeletal figure in front of him. To his shock, this entity intervened and saved Bi Kyun Hyung from his attack. Lee turned to face the necromancer, who had employed the skill to rescue Bi Kyun Hyung. Confused and frustrated, Lee demanded an explanation. Unable to believe that she had just aided Bi Kyun Hyung, necromancer remained evasive, avoiding giving Lee Oriam a direct answer. Lee, in the midst of the confusion, began to suspect that the necromancer might be associated with the chaos group he had previously encountered. He surmised that Bi Kyun Hyung had joined the chaos faction. However, the necromancer seemed to sense an impending attack. Before Lee could react, Kim Shi we all appeared right above the necromancer, launching an attack using her skill. The necromancer was taken aback by Kim Shi we all's sudden appearance and assault, trying to defend herself from the unexpected attack. Kim Shi we all launched another attack on the necromancer, but the necromancer skillfully defended herself using her. The girl, caught in the midst of their battle, was terrified, fearing for her life. Kim Chi we all reassured her that her attack wasn't finished yet. The necromancer, undeterred, prepared to face Kim Chi we all, using her skill. Meanwhile, Leo Riem observed their intense fight, searching for an opportunity. Suddenly, Lee made a move and attacked the necromancer. She was astonished at how Lee had managed to bypass her skill, which was designed to reduce dexterity and poison anyone who came into contact with the skeletal hands. Leo Riem urged Kim Chi we all to finish the battle. She acknowledged his request. The necromancer, now nervous and shocked by the combined strength of Kim Shi we all and Leo Riem, anxiously awaited their next move. Kim Shi we all struck at the necromancer again, but to her surprise, nothing seemed to happen. Suddenly, the system intervened, announcing that the time limit for selecting quest rewards had been reached, and they were about to be transported. The necromancer breathed a sigh of relief, grateful that she hadn't lost her life this time. Leo Riem realized that the reward selection timer continued because they were seen as competitors, not as interruptions. The necromancer, not one to back down, told Leo Riem that she would see him again in their next encounter. Leo Riem confidently responded that judging from today's events, he felt like he could have beaten her even without giving it his all. This remark irked the necromancer, who blamed her less than stellar performance on the newbie she had brought with her that day. She vowed to reveal her true skills and defeat him in the future. With this exchange, they were all transported away from the chaotic battle. Kim Chi we all asked Lee how he was feeling because his face was covered in wounds. Lee reassured her that he was okay, although the injuries were quite visible. Outside, there was a flurry of activity with fire trucks and ambulances surrounding the school building. Kim suggested that they leave quietly, and they made their way to a different location. Kim Chi we all believed that they were currently in a spot where no one could see them, so it was safe to heal. Leo Riem decided to use healing potions today because they couldn't risk being discovered by chaos while using a healing skill that took time. Concerned about Han Sa Jung's condition, Leo Riem asked Kim Chi we all for an update. She explained that she had used her skill to heal Han Sa Jung and had moved her to a safe location. Han Sa Jung should be at the hospital receiving medical care. Suddenly, Kim received a phone call and informed Lee that she had to go home. Leo Riem wondered if someone had tried to contact him after hearing the news. He took out his phone, only to find it broken, likely a casualty of the recent chaos. Inside the chaos hideout, members were gathered, including the unconscious Bi Kyun Hyung. The necromancer's partner expressed disappointment in the new recruit, claiming that they had high hopes for someone they believed was skilled but now considered them useless. The partner explained that the newbie had been defeated by an Avenger, despite being in the ranged dealer class. Another girl in the group tried to defend the newbie, urging her partner not to be too harsh, especially considering that the recruit wasn't even a ranker yet. Her partner responded by mentioning that he had assigned her to watch over the newbie, but she had also been defeated. Their argument was escalating, and it seemed like they were on the verge of a fight. However, someone intervened to stop them from coming to blows. The man, Ryu Yon, interrupted the escalating argument between the Chaos members and suggested that if they wanted to fight, they should do so outside. Ryu Yon had been summoned because the president informed him that the was starting soon, so he would be staying with them for a while. As Ryu Yon observed Bi Kyun Hyung, 
he thought about the dynamics of the Executioner and Avenger classes. Even though Beek Yun Heung was a ranker, the Executioner held a higher position in the class hierarchy, suggesting that the issue might be with Beek Yun Heung's skills, experience, or both. Ryu Yun considered that the real problem might be the Avenger, who appeared to be strong enough to challenge the traditional class hierarchy. Ryu Yun concluded that if they allowed Lee to continue developing his skills unchecked, he could potentially become a threat to the president's plans. Ryu Yun contemplated his options, considering Beek Yun Heung's desire to kill Leo Riem himself. However, he recognized that this might take too long, and Ryu Yun decided to take matters into his own hands. Ryu Yun belonged to the Trick Maker class and held the fifth rank. Meanwhile, Lee's sister had been anxiously waiting for her brother. When Lee finally arrived, he greeted her with a Nuna, a term for addressing an older sister. Nuna questioned why he was so late, and Leo Riem casually replied that he had been chatting with his friends. Nuna expressed her worry, asking why he hadn't picked up her calls. She expressed her deep concern, telling Lee that she had been worried sick after watching the news. Leo Riem, pretending to be ignorant, asked her which news she was referring to. Nuna then explained that there had been some unexplained explosions at Lee's school, resulting in numerous injuries and even some fatalities. She showed him the news on her device. Lee decided not to reveal that he had been at the school during the incident to spare his sister from worry. However, Nuna noticed bloodstains on Lee's uniform and questioned him about them. Leo Riem quickly made up an excuse, claiming that he had tripped while playing soccer during lunchtime and had a nosebleed as a result. Nuna, clearly skeptical, pointed out that if he had fallen while playing soccer, his face should also have been affected. Caught off guard, Lee stammered that he had lied and admitted that he had been at school during the incident, despite appearing uninjured. Nuna expressed concern, suggesting that Lee might have sustained internal injuries. She mentioned that some people die from internal bleeding because they don't realize they have such injuries. She insisted on contacting a doctor and taking him to the hospital immediately. Leo Riem, still wanting to keep his involvement in the school incident a secret, reassured Nuna that he felt perfectly fine and that he needed to go to school the next day. However, Nuna informed him that the school would be closed for a week due to the incident. Overwhelmed with fear and relief, she suddenly hugged him and began to cry. Lee couldn't help but think that she had only shown such affection when they were children. The next day, Lee waited anxiously at the hospital. He couldn't help but worry about the results of his checkup. He feared that the results might reveal something strange, perhaps indicating that he wasn't actually human. Suddenly, someone called him and asked him to come into the doctor's room. Lee entered the room and greeted the doctor. The doctor, recognizing him, mentioned that he believed they had met before. He then asked Lee if he happened to remember him. Leo Riem tried to recall when he had met the doctor before. The doctor asked if he remembered, and then mentioned that they had met on Christmas last year. It suddenly clicked in Lee's mind, and he remembered that this doctor's name was An Noah, the one who had helped bring his drunk sister home last year. Dr. An Noah was impressed that Lee remembered his name and commented on how much Lee had grown since their last meeting, almost to the point of being unrecognizable. He then proceeded to check Leo Riem's test results. Lee asked if there was anything wrong with his results, and Dr. An Noah reassured him that everything appeared to be perfectly normal, and there was no need for further checkups. Lee sighed with relief, but the doctor also noted that something seemed strangely artificially perfect about all the results. Dr. An Noah explained to Lee that most people's test results have a slight variation. Even healthy athletes, who might have results like 7.9 or 8.2 instead of a perfectly even 8. Lee's results, on the other hand, were precisely on the expected number. Lee asked if there was something wrong with that, to which the doctor replied that there was absolutely nothing wrong. He was simply impressed at how healthy Lee appeared to be, possibly due to his age as a teenager. As Lee contemplated how all his test results were perfect, he couldn't help but think it might be because he was like a game character. Then, Dr. An Noah asked Lee how he was feeling, Lee was a bit puzzled by the question, and the doctor clarified that he had heard about the terrible incident at Lee's school, with casualties and injuries, and he was curious about how Lee felt as someone who had been on site during the incident. Lee found himself immersed in the memories of the incident at school, particularly the moment when innocent students had lost their lives. He confessed to Dr. An Noah that he felt an overwhelming anger, so intense that he couldn't find the words to describe it. Lee lamented that if he had just put in a little more effort, perhaps he could have prevented the tragedy. He was consumed by self-blame for not having been able to do more. Dr. An Noah reassured Lee that it wasn't his fault, it was simply an unfortunate accident. However, he empathized with Lee's feelings, explaining that many survivors of such terrible incidents often grapple with guilt 
questioning why they were the ones who survived and if there was more they could have done to save others. Dr. On Noah shared that those thoughts and questions, the ones that fill survivors' minds with guilt, tend to be persistent and can lead to self-blame over time. He then encouraged Lee to consider that, given the circumstances, he had likely done the best he could at that moment. Lee was taken aback by this perspective. Continuing, Dr. On Noah advised Lee to forgive himself. He emphasized that self-forgiveness was crucial because it would empower Lee to give his best if he ever faced such a situation again. Lee grasped the essence of the doctor's words. Dr. On Noah concluded by stating that this was his personal opinion and, if the matter continued to trouble Lee, he recommended seeking the help of a therapist. He stressed that the emotional scars acquired during youth could persist indefinitely. Lee understood the gravity of this advice. As Lee was about to leave, Dr. On Noah halted him, expressing a desire to ask something. Lee stopped and turned to face the doctor. Dr. On Noah inquired if Lee still played games, mentioning that he had heard from Ariam that Lee was exceptionally skilled at the game Ergosphere Online. This revelation surprised Lee and he replied that he did play games occasionally but had been too busy with studies to do so recently. Dr. On Noah then suggested that they play the game together when they had the opportunity, adding that he wasn't nearly as proficient as Lee. Lee agreed to the doctor's proposition. As he walked away, Lee couldn't help but reflect on how unexpected it was for Dr. On Noah to bring up gaming in their conversation. His sister had a tendency to share random information with people, and Lee couldn't help but wonder if she was dating Dr. On Noah. Just as these thoughts crossed his mind, Lee's phone rang, and he noticed that it was Kim Chi Weal calling. He quickly headed to the location where Kim had called him to meet. When he arrived, Kim Chi Weal explained that Rayson wanted to meet them that night. Lee was aware of this but wondered why she had called him here so suddenly. Kim Chi Weal then asked him to turn around, and she hugged him from behind, instructing Lee to hold the embrace for 30 seconds. Lee was taken aback by this unexpected display of affection and wondered what had prompted Kim Chi Weal to act this way. Kim Chi Weal explained that she couldn't stop thinking about what had happened to Han Sa Jung. Kim Chi Weal shared how she couldn't stop thinking about the incident where she had almost died at the hands of a monster. The memory haunted her, especially her own selfish hesitation as she watched the danger unfold. She expressed that she had believed herself to be different from her parents, but now she felt just as selfish and shameless as them. Lee listened attentively and then gently told her that her hesitation had been because of him. He explained that she had worried about both of them receiving penalties if she had used her skill to save Han Sa Jung. In that brief moment, she had considered both him and Han Sa Jung and had ultimately saved Han Sa Jung's life. Lee reassured her that she wasn't selfish and encouraged her to stop blaming herself. Kim Chi Weal teased Lee about his unexpected hug, demanding five cups of strawberry milkshake as payment. Lee agreed, and they continued their conversation. He inquired about the reason Rayson wanted to meet them and if something was going on. Kim Chi Weal admitted she didn't know either. Later, during a meeting at night, Yu Soong had dropped a bombshell. They were going chaos hunting. Lee Oriam and Kim Chi Weal were shocked. Lee asked how Yu Soong had found out the location of the chaos base. Yu Soong explained that there were multiple ways, but the most crucial one had been related to the incident at Lee's school. Yu Soong continued to explain that they had investigated several places they believed could be potential chaos bases. During the incident at Lee's school, they had witnessed a chaos member entering their base in a hurry, indicating it was unlikely to be a trap. They had maintained surveillance until early morning and observed multiple chaos members coming and going, confirming that it was indeed the chaos base. Kim Chi we all questioned why Yu Soong was sharing all these details with them. Yu Soong his response was simple, they were allies. She wanted Kim Chi we all and Leo Riem to have the opportunity to seek revenge and take down those who had ruined their school and harmed their friends. Kim Chi we all and Leo Riem were taken aback by this revelation. Yu Soong then asked them what they wanted to do. Yu Soong explained that she wanted to inform them of this opportunity to avoid any potential conflicts later on. She then asked if Kim Chi we all and Leo Riem would be willing to join the raid on Chaos's base tonight. Leo Riem immediately agreed, surprising Kim Chi Weol. He went on to reveal that he knew someone within Chaos, someone who was once a friend but was now on the opposing side. He didn't want this person to be captured by others, he wanted to personally bring him down. Yu Soong respected Lee's decision and left the final choice up to him. Yu Soong turned to Kim Chi Weol and inquired about her decision. Kim responded that she would join Lee since they were in the same party. However, Lee suggested that she didn't need to come, as this was a personal matter between him and Beek yoon -hyung. Kim explained that it wasn't a matter of choice. They had received a quest notification for tonight, and it was a penalty quest. Rejecting it wasn't an option. 
Leo Riem considered their penalty situation and realized that they had recently incurred penalty points for using healing skills on Han Sajung. However, he thought that if the only offense was using a healing skill, the penalty shouldn't be too severe, and they might even be able to avoid it with the funds they had. Kim Shi Weol added that she had also used healing skills on a few more people after that incident, which likely contributed to their higher penalty points. Their combined penalty score was minus 12 0 and they had been penalized for using skills on normal individuals eight times and using items four times. Kim Shi Weol calculated that they were 500 points short of covering the penalty with the money they currently had. Kim Shi Weol explained to Lee that if they wanted to avoid the penalty quest, they would have to surrender all their status points and items. She emphasized that while they could convert the reward money from the quest into real currency, there was no way to convert their own real money into in-game rewards, so they couldn't use their personal funds to cover the penalty. Leo Riem reassured Kim, saying that she shouldn't be the one apologizing, she had done the right thing by helping others. He pointed out that the real issue was the game's system penalizing her for healing people who were hurt due to the game's circumstances. He told her not to worry about it. Kim understood his perspective. Yu Suma, who had been observing their conversation, finally broke the silence and offered to lend them 500 million won to cover the penalty if they needed it. Kim and Lee decided to take on the penalty quest tonight rather than participating in the upcoming war. Yusuma realized that she had made a mistake in pushing them towards revenge. Despite Kim and Lee being rankers, they were still just kids, and she shouldn't have encouraged them to seek vengeance. Yusunga advised them to focus on completing quests, honing their skills, and gathering information. She suggested that they avoid getting entangled in guild conflicts like the one brewing. She assured them that they would handle such matters. Lee listened attentively to her words. Yusunga concluded by saying that their discussion was over, and she encouraged Kim and Lee to head back. She advised them to prepare for the upcoming war and not to worry about the 500-point penalty quest, as she was confident that they would easily clear it. After their discussion with Yu Seunga, Kim Shi Weol and Leo Riem continued on their way. Kim remarked to Lee that the guild master was more sensible than she had initially thought. She admitted that she had expected Yu Seunga to be the type to do whatever it took to achieve their goals and would push them into the war at any cost. Leo Rian speculated that perhaps Yu Seunga believed they weren't suited for guild wars, and excluding them from the conflict might be part of her strategy. Kim Shi Weol agreed, considering it as goal-oriented behavior. Changing the subject, Lee asked if she had checked her inventory after the X quest. They both examined their inventories, and Kim Shi Weol mentioned that she had found some items she hadn't seen before, particularly an item called the. Kim asked Lee if he had also received the same item. Leo Riem replied that he hadn't received that item but had obtained. Kim Shi Weol expressed her surprise, mentioning that she had never seen these items in the game. Lee explained that they wouldn't know what the items did unless they used them, and the item descriptions didn't provide much clarity. Kim suggested that they try Lee's item first since her item had a limited number of uses. Lee agreed and used the item. Suddenly, they found themselves in a strange room, which surprised them. Then, the system welcomed them to their private space, the. The system explained that in this room, they could rest and train, as well as use it for item storage. They could share this space with their party members and, if necessary, permit non-party members to enter. Leo Riem asked if this was some kind of resting room within the game. Kim Chi Weol explained that they could even drink without any worries in this room. Leo Riem suggested that they should meet here before starting quests next time as it would make it more efficient for them to decide which items to buy. Kim was checking something, and Lee looked at her, asking if something seemed strange to her. Kim Chi Weol replied that she was just curious about where this space had come from. Everything felt so real, but the scenery outside wasn't the same as the alley where they had been before entering this room. This suggested that they had been transported here, but she wondered exactly where this place was. Leo Riem pondered for a moment, half-jokingly suggesting that this might be the afterlife. Kim urged him not to say anything like that, and Lee agreed, suggesting that they not think too deeply about it for now. Kim Chi we all reasoned that it wasn't possible to find out where they were with their current knowledge, so dwelling on it wouldn't be productive. Instead, she suggested they focus on learning more about her item. Kim instructed the system to provide detailed information about her item. The system explained that when the specified item is used, the user can summon the disciple of the great sage Argus. They can then ask questions about quests and monsters' weaknesses. If no questions are asked, they can receive a blessing skill from the disciple. Leo Riem remarked that it seemed more valuable to ask questions rather than receiving a blessing skill. 
Kim Chi we all agreed and pointed out that they could replace blessing skills with other items. She then decided to use the item, the bell that calls Argus's disciple. Lee interrupted and questioned Kim Chi we all's decision to use the item, reminding her that they could only use it twice and that they should carefully consider when to use it. He suggested thinking it through before proceeding. Kim Chi we all, however, insisted that it didn't matter and that they already knew what questions to ask. She went ahead and used the item. Suddenly, a girl appeared as a result of using the item. Lee commented that the girl was cute, which earned him a furious look from Kim Chi we all. Kim Chi we all then asked the first question, inquiring about Leo Riem's secret sexual preferences, surprising Lee. The girl replied that she couldn't answer that question. Kim followed up by asking the girl to provide information about the Horizon event. The girl explained that she didn't know the details but had heard prophecies from her master, which she would share. She described the prophecy, when six pillars collapse, it shall come together with thunder. The gates of taboo shall open, and a moonless night shall fall. Those who have not been enlightened will depart from the holy land to the land of the ark. Those that survive shall lose their lives to beasts. So, they must fight, and fight more. This is the only way to fulfill the desires of those who remain in the holy land, and the only way to end the banquet. Leo Riem was surprised after hearing these details. Meanwhile, a man sat alone, engrossed in his phone. Suddenly, he thought he saw something unusual. Suddenly, someone attacked the man from behind and swiftly ended his life. The attacker turned out to be a member of Yu Seung-ha's guild. He inquired if the portal was open, and Yu Seung-ha confirmed that it was and that she would be the first to enter. The man then activated his assassin skill, Assassin's Secret Passage. Emerging from this secret passage, Yu Seung-ha found herself facing a group of Chaos members. The man initially expressed his intention to deal with them alone. But Yu Seung-ha intervened, telling him that she should handle the trash since she had spotted it first. With that, Yu Seung-ha unleashed her skill, Path of the Queen, to confront the Chaos members. Following this encounter, Yu Seung-ha expressed her belief that the real Chaos members were inside, prompting her to suggest to the man that they should proceed further into the Chaos base. As they entered, they were met by a man who greeted them and mentioned that he had prepared numerous teacups, anticipating a larger group. Yu Seung-ha retorted that she and her companion were sufficient guests for him. It was clear that Yu Seung-ha was ready for a confrontation with the Chaos members. The man expressed his desire to meet Yu Seung-ha, the leader of the Raisin Guild, as she was currently the person closest to achieving victory. Yu Seung-ha reciprocated this sentiment, stating that she had wanted to meet him because she aimed to eliminate individuals associated with Chaos. Just like him. The man inquired about her motivations for killing these individuals, and Yu Seung-ha explained that she sought revenge for her guild while eliminating potential threats to their victory. In a surprising turn, the man offered her the equivalent prize money, and an additional 22 billion won as compensation if she agreed to quietly leave his base and forfeit the event. However, Yu Seung-ha, after considering his proposal, firmly rejected it. Yu Seung-ha questioned why she would consider such an offer when she was so close to victory. She explained that she aimed to claim the event prize for various reasons, but most importantly, she was just a normal player in the game, and it was only natural for a player to strive for victory on their own. After all, that's why people played games in the first place. The man acknowledged her perspective, understanding that people played games for the thrill of winning and having fun. He admitted his mistake. Then, he made a signal and activated his skill. Thanks to this skill, all of his nearby party members suddenly appeared, startling Yu Seung-ha and her party members as they realized they were surrounded by Chaos members. Yu Seung-ha instructed her party members to open the portal and bring everyone in since they knew it wasn't a trap and they were ready to confront Chaos head-on. The man mentioned that it would take about 45 seconds to open a portal capable of transporting multiple people, and asked if she could hold out for that long. Yu Seung-ha confidently replied that 45 seconds were more than enough, citing her experience in other guild wars where she had held her own. She believed that if luck was on her side, she could even eliminate one or two of their opponents. Her party member expressed concern and advised her not to overexert herself, but she reassured him, saying that 45 seconds was a short enough time not to go overboard. With determination, Yu Seung-ha moved forward and unleashed her skill, launching an attack on Chaos. After Yu Seung-ha's powerful attack, the Chaos members were stunned by the force of her skill. The leader of Chaos acknowledged that they had lost their upper hand in the battle. Yu Seung-ha continued to engage in combat with the party members of Chaos. Suddenly, the Necromancer girl launched an attack on Yu Seung-ha, employing her skill. However, Yu Seung-ha swiftly countered with her skill causing harm to all the Chaos Party members. Ryu Yon then entered the fray, launching an attack on Yu Seung-ha. 
However, she managed to defend against his assault. Ryuyo noted that it had been a while since they had crossed paths, possibly even in a previous game. Yusunga replied that she tended to erase memories of men she had met before. Yusunga unleashed her skill, striking at Ryu Yon. But Ryu Yon skillfully defended against the attack and used his skill, trapping Yusunga within. Suddenly, a Chaos member lunged at Yusunga from behind, preparing to attack her. Yusunga was momentarily unsure how to respond. But in the nick of time, Kang Ikju appeared and intercepted the attacker, thwarting his assault. Kang Ikju inquired about Yu Sungha's well-being, and she reassured him that she was perfectly fine. All of her team members had arrived at the scene. With her team assembled, Yu Sungha ordered them to launch a coordinated attack on Chaos, intent on ending the conflict. Ryu Yon inquired of his leader about their course of action. The leader suggested they observe for the time being since it was his first encounter with the Raisin Guild in person. He expressed his intention to watch from the shadows and instructed Ryu Yon to engage in the battle. Ryu Yon contemplated that he had assured the leader he would handle the entire race and guild, but he wasn't entirely confident as both guilds seemed to be evenly matched in terms of power. This implies that until someone dies and the balance is disrupted, it's impossible to determine the outcome of the battle between the Chaos Guild and the Raisin Guild. Meanwhile, Kim Shi Weol and Leo Riem found themselves transported to a college campus for their quest. Leo Riem began to share his thoughts with Kim Shi Weol about what they had learned from Argus's disciple earlier. He had been contemplating this since they returned home. Leo Riem wondered if, for the event, it's not about when it will happen but rather under what conditions it will occur. Kim Shi Weol asked if it could be something like a boss monster that needs specific requirements to be met before it's unsealed. Leo Riem responded that while the prophecy didn't directly mention the conditions, it did mention when the six pillars collapsed, which made him think that this might be the condition for triggering the event. He speculated that once users fulfilled this condition, the event would commence. Kim Shi we all wondered if they needed to destroy pillars of buildings or something similar. Suddenly, the system appeared and announced that there was only one minute remaining in the quest. Leo Riem asked the system for details about the quest. The system explained that it was a normal subjugation quest, but other users would also be participating. In shared quests, all participants would be rewarded equally, regardless of who cleared it. This meant that they could potentially earn rewards even if others completed the quest without their direct involvement. Kim Shi we all suggested that they could simply go inside then take a nap. However, Leo Riem disagreed, stating that they should complete the quest quickly so as not to inconvenience anyone. Kim Shi we all assured him that she was just joking. Kim Shi we all wondered what kind of users they would encounter during the quest and expressed her hope that they wouldn't run into anyone from Chaos. Leo Riem agreed, noting that Chaos was probably engaged in a battle with the Raisin Guild at that moment. He added that he hoped the other users they would meet would be as pleasant as the ones they had encountered previously. Kim asked him if he was referring to the Wind Rider and the Wall Builder they had met before. Lee responded affirmatively, praising the Wind Rider and the Wall Builder for being cooperative and skilled. As they prepared for the quest, the system announced that it had begun. However, to their surprise, nothing seemed to be happening. Kim Chi we all expressed concern about the unusual quietness, a sentiment shared by Lee. Suddenly, they heard sounds emanating from behind a nearby building. Lee suggested they investigate, but Kim hesitated, thinking they might not need to go there themselves. Their thoughts were interrupted by approaching footsteps. Both Kim Chi we all and Leo Riem readied their weapons in anticipation. As the figure drew closer, they realized it was a boy who was crying and desperately shouting for help. The man continued to approach, his tears streaming. When he noticed Lee and Kim standing in front of him, relief washed over his face. He greeted them enthusiastically and pleaded for their help. However, Kim Shi Weol and Leo Riem exchanged cautious glances before raising their weapons, pointing them at the man. The man was taken aback by their sudden hostility. He protested, emphasizing that he wasn't carrying any weapons. Leo Riem countered, stating that the man's lack of a weapon was suspicious, especially given that the quest had already started. He voiced the concern that the man might be a PK user who pretended to be innocent only to attack unsuspecting players later. Kim Chi we all demanded that the man show them his weapon before they could trust him or engage in further conversation. The man reluctantly agreed and revealed his weapon, A. The man's weapon, though, was typically used by adventurer class players. Kim Shi we all turned to Lee and asked how someone could become a ranker with a merchant type class, clearly puzzled by this anomaly. Leo Riem, in turn, directed a question at the man, inquiring about his rank in the game. The man confessed that he didn't have a rank, he simply enjoyed the game for its story and didn't pursue ranking. Lee was taken aback by this revelation, non-rankers weren't supposed to transition. 
he asked Kim for her thoughts on the matter, as only rankers were supposed to undergo the transition process. Kim Shi we all explained that there were non-rankers in the race and guild who had undergone the transition, suggesting that there might be other conditions or exceptions. However, their conversation was abruptly interrupted by the man, who urgently warned them that monsters were approaching. He exclaimed that now was not the time for discussions. As if on cue, a monster appeared and attacked them. Leo Riem swiftly defended against the monster's assault, his mind racing as he realized that he had never encountered this type of monster before. As the monster attacked, Leo Riem's mind raced, considering the possibility that this might be a variant, a unique and stronger version of a typical monster. Kim Shi Weol, on the other hand, advised the man to step aside if he didn't want to join the fight. The monster unleashed a skill called, which left both Kim Shi Weol and Leo Riem in shock. Lee observed that the monster had swiftly evaded the confinement skill with its quick movements, suggesting that dexterity and flexibility might be its special traits. The monster then turned its attention towards Lee and launched an attack. Lee expertly defended against the attack and noted that the monster's strikes didn't inflict significant damage, nor did they have knockback effects. However, what made this battle challenging was the monster's intricate attack pattern. Unlike normal monsters, which typically had a single joint in their arm, this creature had two, making it impossible for him to anticipate its attacks. Lee realized that he needed to adapt quickly, decipher the attack pattern, and uncover the monster's weaknesses. The man shared a valuable piece of information with Leo Riem about the monster's weakness, explaining that the creature's vulnerable spot was its waist, particularly the right side where it bore a scar. Kim Shi we all grasped this detail, ready to act on it. Leo Riem initiated the attack, employing his skill to strike the monster's right waist. To his astonishment, the monster collapsed, stunned by the blow. It was evident that the man's advice had been accurate, as targeting the creature's weakness had proved remarkably effective. Kim Shi we all wasted no time, utilizing her skill to deliver the final blow. The monster let out a piercing cry and perished. Kim noted that it had been a simpler victory than expected. However, Leo Riem questioned whether they had successfully cleared the quest. To this, the man behind them responded negatively, explaining that there should be one more monster remaining. He suggested that this monster was likely the gatekeeper of the northern castle, and since there typically were two gatekeepers, he believed there should be another one yet to be encountered. Leo Riem was curious and asked the man how he had acquired this information since he'd never seen this monster in the game before. The man shared his insight, revealing that the monster had never actually appeared in the game. Instead, players could learn about it by obtaining a specific item from an NPC, which would then unlock the story of the locked northern castle. He went on to recount the tale, explaining that it revolved around a count who had sealed the castle gates due to his heartbreak caused by his nephew's rebellion. In the game, players couldn't enter the castle, but if they managed to find the item known as the Rusty Key of the Northern Castle, they could access the story. According to this narrative, there were gatekeepers tasked with safeguarding the castle, even though they had suffered injuries during the nephew's revolt. Despite their unhealed wounds, they had remained loyal to the Count, protecting his castle. Kim Shi we all was intrigued but questioned how the man knew that the monster they had just encountered was the one from this story. The man explained that he couldn't have recognized what these monsters looked like in the game since they didn't make an appearance there. He continued, mentioning that players could uncover the story regarding the monsters and the Count's appearances within the Northern Blackstone Dungeon. This dungeon featured murals that vividly depicted the narrative of the Nephew's Rebellion. Kim Shi we all expressed her surprise, confessing that she had never been aware of such a hidden story within the game. Leo Riem was curious and asked the man if he knew every single hidden story in Ergosphere Online. The man clarified that he didn't know them all, but when he factored in the stories he'd read about on the internet, he estimated that he was acquainted with about 98% of them. Both Kim Chi Weol and Leo Riem were astonished. The man emphasized that, while Ergosphere Online was primarily an action-based RPG game, many players tended to overlook the wealth of hidden details within it. He encouraged them to delve deeper, explaining that there were numerous small, hidden elements waiting to be discovered. The man continued to share his enthusiasm for the game, explaining that there were stories about every little thing within Ergosphere Online, ranging from items to passerby NPCs. He emphasized that if players delved into each of these stories, it felt as if they were living in an entirely new world. He recounted a time when he was so engrossed in the game that he played for an uninterrupted 50 hours. Lee and Kim listened attentively to the man's stories. Then, Kim Shi we all inquired why, if he loved the game so much, he had run away from the monster earlier. She acknowledged that the adventure class was relatively weak in combat, but could still fight. 
the man admitted that the monsters scared him, and while he managed to complete the tutorial, the thought of battling monsters with his life on the line was terrifying. As a result, he had been rejecting all quests to lead a normal life. However, he accidentally used the discount skill when making a purchase online, and was penalized for it. He pleaded with them to protect him from the monsters. Kim Chi we all turned to Leo Ryum, seeking his opinion on the matter as the man didn't appear to be a PK user. Kim Chi we all turned to Leo Ryum and asked for his opinion on whether they should help the man. Leo Ryum took a moment to consider and then addressed the man, stating that they would assist him in surviving the quest. However, he had a condition, the man must share what he knew about the event. The man, somewhat surprised, asked if they were referring to the sanctuary and rituals of the cults. Kim Chi Weol and Leo Ryum were momentarily stunned and confessed that they didn't understand. The man reassured them that he would be more than happy to share what he knew, although some of it might be speculative due to biases. He pledged to divulge all the information he possessed. Kim Chi Weol and Leo Ryum exchanged glances, and then Lee extended his hand in agreement. He told the man that he had to assist them to the best of his abilities. The man accepted the terms, and they sealed the deal. Afterward, Kim Chi we all suggested that, now that they had exchanged contact information, they should continue with the quest as they had already lost a fair amount of time. The man mentioned that he would attempt to use a skill useful for the adventurer class and activated the skill. Lee noticed that the light was heading towards the back of the building, and Kim Chi we all immediately urged them to go. They assumed that there was still one more monster left. As they approached the rear of the building, they were startled to discover two monsters waiting there. Kim gave the man a questioning look, and he quickly apologized, explaining that the story didn't specify how many gatekeepers there were. He asked for their advice on what to do next. Lee responded that there was no need to lure the monsters one by one since they now knew the monster's weaknesses and attack patterns. The man was taken aback by Lee's confidence. Lee turned to Kim and told her that he would take on both monsters simultaneously, requesting her support. Kim Chi we all agreed to cast her spell at the right moment. The man was incredulous, asking if they were really going to face the monsters head on. Lee confirmed it, explaining that it took him a bit of time to become familiar with the monsters' attack patterns. But now that he had figured them out, dealing with two of them shouldn't be an issue. Additionally, he mentioned that these monsters were merely penalty quest monsters worth only 500 points. Lee proceeded to launch an attack on the monsters, leaving the man astonished by Leo Ream's confidence and skill.